a vision becomes a milestone when it helps make our lives richer with love and laughter. When it helps make a cleaner, smarter and a more beautiful planet. So that you can set off on joyous new journeys and adventures. Building stronger bonds and bridging impossible distances which take you from the ever new to the forever beautiful. Opening up vistas and windows to a vibrant new world. A vision becomes a milestone when it touches millions of lives. Aditya Birla Group. Big in your life. Amongst the fastest developing states in India, a treasure trove of minerals, an oasis of nature's bounty, powering India's growth, adding steel to its dreams, a leader in cleanliness, virgin in its beauty, vibrant in its culture, a land of promise, a land of opportunities, a state like none other, Chhattisgarh. Thanking me? <laughs> I'll tell you. When you buy an Usha sewing machine, more than 1% of the proceeds go towards empowering women in rural India through Usha Salai schools. That's why. You have 10 minutes or I'm gone. I'll take a lot less. Send in the drones. Show maps. It seems like everybody wants you. I'm born magnetic. The all new I-20. Born magnetic. Rishi, what are you talking about? You're saying that I have to save all the dangers of life. Then you're in trouble for me. क्योंकि जो कॉकरोच से डर जाए वो मेरी क्या रक्षा करेगा हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द एटीन एडिशन ऑफ द हिंदुस्तान टाइम्स लीडरशिप समिट एंड इट्स वीक थ्री ऑफ द समिट दैट स्टार्टेड ऑन नवंबर 19 एंड इज गोइंग ऑन टिल नेक्स्ट वीक नाउ फॉर टुडेज सेशन वी हैव अ फैंटास्टिक लाइनअप ऑफ स्पीकर्स एंड यू नो इफ द पैंडेमिक हैज बीन worry about the economy and finances there was one thing across the world that brought us joy and it's true of everyone now that is something that has united people across the world and that is uh, it was the comfort of food and of eating and in the absence of physical interactions it was one that people joy in as a community there were people who had never cooked before who took to not just making the daily fare but ambitious gourmet dishes there were people who couldn't meet their families but who remembered them by cooking their favorite dishes and we all took comfort from sharing those images to unite online in this community celebration of eating that's what our first chef Massimo Bottura and his daughter Alexa did when they launched kitchen quarantine when the lockdown mm -hmm. started the instagram live showed what patura family did every night during the italian quarantine period for them it was a fun way to interact with families all over the world cook together share ideas as for this award winning restaurant and teach people good practices in the kitchen such as cleaning out the refrigerator to limit food waste Memories of home cooking are also what inspired our second speaker, Chef Gagan Anand, to look towards Indian food and setting out on his own in 2007 in Bangkok from a safe background of being 
successful within the Taj group. By 2019, his restaurant, Gagan, was judged the number four best restaurant, <coughs> with the highest ranking for an Asian restaurant. But he was again looking for his own individual satisfaction instead of doing things for his investors. He then set out to and found his own expression of his ideas, including using his two Michelin star experience to nurture upcoming talent. What do these two best in their craft chefs think about how the pandemic has changed their work? Will eating out go back to how it was or will they have to yet again employ their game changing skills? Gagan Anand and Masma Batura are in conversation with our own favorite chef here in India, Ritu Dalmia. Ritu, it's over to you. Uh, I am very happy, Sunetra, to be here, not only because of your lovely smile, but I'm here with two amazing people. One man, Gagan Anand, who can speak actually more than I do and drives me crazy, but I have met my match there. And then Massimo, who actually is uh, someone I've known for a very long time, even before I met him, because I don't even know if Massimo knows this, but one of the reasons I became a chef was a woman called Faith Willinger, who's uh, my mentor and she's the reason why I'm a chef today. And I still remember in the early 2000s, I think Massimo, you had just gotten your second star and Faith was talking to me about you and she said, I have this crazy man Massimo, Ritu, you better use him very quickly for an event because very soon and he works out of such a small kitchen. This was early 2000. And then, of course, life's been history. When we talk about chefs, people talk about anger, people talk about abuses. But when people talk about Massimo Bottura, they talk about someone who's gentle, who's humble, someone who's a very kind person and someone I'm very proud to call my friend. So Gagan, let's come to you, my naughty little boy. I met you in 2010. You had just opened Gagan. All my friends in Thailand were talking about this amazing restaurant. And I go there and you just bombard me with nonstop talking. And I said, this Calcutta boy talks more than I do. And I'm sure he knows jack shit about what he's doing. And then you made me a carbonara. I still remember that carbonara very well. <laughs> yes, he made me a carbonara. <laughs> You're on mute. Uh, Massimo, you're on mute. And that carbonara made me realize that I should never have preconceived notions because I had met a genius. And that's what you are. You've you always know, spoken. Sorry, go ahead, Gagan. And tell you a secret. You wanted a carbonara. I went to the 7 Eleven. I bought it from a Caribbean store. I just walked <laughs> in. <into it. laughs> Yes, yeah. that's why it tasted so good. But coming to you, Gagan, you have always broken every law in the book. You are this naughty boy who doesn't like to follow rules. You have always done things at your own uh, way. 2020 was difficult for everyone, but I think for you, 2019 already changes started. What has your journey been in the last two years and how do you think this has changed naughty boy Gagan. Has it made him more naughty or has he finally grown up and become a little bit more subtle, more mellow, or you're ready to rock and roll and shock the world all over again? I think uh, it's a perfect break. I think for chefs like us who travel every day, we're on a flight. We miss being in our restaurants. Our guests don't see us enough. And uh, I think the best thing about COVID is that every chef, just not me or Massimo, but even a normal chef will rediscover his cooking. He will rediscover what food is. And I think the best thing is that if you look at last 20 years since this social media, microwave ovens, uh, all this fast food culture that became a part of our society, uh, people start cooking home in COVID. Nobody baked the bread, none they had to bake a bread, things like that. So making an egg also was seeming difficult in today's uh, modern world of workaholics. So for them, 
they will recognize chef as more important people in society not just a doctor not just an army but or a, or or somebody who's educated but chefs itself especially from india where chefs are the last in the category of of Absolutely. of of a, of a career Absolutely, but do you see some changes that happened in your life in this year apart from cooking at home? Do you see the world changing in terms of the world of Gagan, world of the restaurant? Or physically, I became a much more fitter person. I lost twenty two kilos. That. I didn't want to say it because I was very upset about it. Uh, well, since I put on the belt, you look fantastic. Massimo, Massimo, you don't dare to talk. You write a book. Okay, 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 okay. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Okay. Skinny <laughs> chef, and look at you. Look at you. Sorry. Go ahead, Gagan. <laughs> no, no, no. I think uh, uh, for me it was a big change. I, I, if you ask me, I do I regret closing a very successful restaurant and taking all all my savings and putting and walking out with 66 people. to do a restaurant and then comes this tsunami of covid and before covid six like two weeks before i opened another restaurant called mr <laughs> as a casual place and everything fell apart but luckily in thailand we somehow luckily managed to be non covid yeah totally so we were very lucky at least the world social distancing was not applicable to our society yeah so we we could continue doing fine dining and yeah. it's a, my only challenge was to retain everybody as a team yeah and not lose people and not get uh not because you see uh, the covid is a biggest threat to fine dining you see so many fine dining restaurants are closing it's a very sad situation uh i mean it's 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 really serious in terms of food so uh, people don't have enough time to eat in a restaurant so it's a lot of things that are coming in and financially it's 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 nothing being seen in the modern <laughs> world like absolutely totally I think threat is fine dining like absolutely. i know chefs who are passing out with me in 97 to 2000 batch are jobless in india and that's sad yeah it, yeah unfortunately it's not been recognized so massimo you know yes, um, yes I, darling Oh, I love that. <laughs> My ears. You know, uh for me, you are not just a chef. As I said, you're a brilliant chef. I love your tortelli. I've always enjoyed your food, but you are not just a chef for me. Uh you know, all my life I always used to say that when I retire, when I give up my restaurant business, I want to do some good in my life. I want to give back to society and one day I will open a uh culinary institute for the helpless i will do this but these were all plans in my head which i will do once when what happens you on the other hand have over the years who apart from being a brilliant chef apart from running an amazing restaurant and now even an amazing guest house maria luigia you mm -hmm. have managed to give back to the society you started with all the canteens you started with food for soup. you made sure sustainability you bought italy on map where food sustainability is concerned where awareness is concerned but this year how has it been yes you did everything but this year this pandemic which made me close more than half of my restaurants only half of my restaurants exist half of them have shut down I have been a very happy person I have to admit this has made me realize that there is no tomorrow and I have to do what I need to do today and not wait for tomorrow what has this one year been for you like apart from food quarantine apart from all these what as a personal journey as well as a journey with Osteria Francescana you know it's been a, a crazy time and uh you know uh, with uh, this coronavirus outbreak everything that uh, was an hour to begin with has fallen away and now we have to live uh, with what we what remains life is big even if uh, even when uh, is silence and still uh, these are rare and precious days that we have and uh, since day 1 uh, i said to myself we have to do something to deserve them 
uh, each one in our uh, each one in our homes together under one roof uh, that shelter the world. Uh, with uh, with the world in lockdown, uh, my family and I uh, at home uh, we decide to share our life with the world and uh, through Instagram and we create kitchen quarantine in which we 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 we. Uh, with no filter, because you know, when you have a child like Charlie, uh, young adults like Charlie, you cannot have filter, and um, and that was uh, uh, just uh, the essence uh, of uh, food for soul. That is my uh, that is my uh, foundation in which uh, we use uh, uh, surplus food. Uh, to feed uh, the people in need uh, in uh, amazing places uh, using uh, beauty because the beauty is the essence of uh, of our of our job uh, what I was what I'm doing it like I don't know you know uh, one thing that I did in all in this period is uh, ask myself a lot of questions you know and one of these is like uh, you know, what is the purpose of a restaurant in 21st century? You know, this is one of the questions. Uh, is it a place to have a meal or is it a place to learn and discover? It's a place where culture is proceeds and share. Um, I always thought uh, of my restaurant as a laboratory of ideas, you know, a place where promote culture, where connect uh, to agriculture, a place for education, learning, grow. Uh, these connections are important uh, to us because to keep us uh, from isolating in our kitchen, you know, they keep us connected in our communities and uh, and uh, and connected uh, to the world. Um, uh, they reminded us that restaurant does not exist only to serve a meal. Uh, you know, but uh, we are at the beginning uh, uh, of the culinary revolution, as I always said, you know, in 2015, we start a humanistic revolution that now is, is like more alive than ever. And uh, one uh, that is leading um, as is a communist is a humanistic revolution that is leading a chef to step out of the kitchen and uh, to connect with communities. And, uh, you know, uh, an issue outside the world of hospitality, you know, can, can chef really make the difference in uh, what they choose uh, to serve at their table? Can really chef, can really the chef uh, be the one who really influence agriculture, um, culture, um, uh, tourism? Uh, uh, um, uh, training, uh, social issues. Yes, because I always say, you know, our small restaurants are like a Renaissance atelier in which we create culture every day. I wrote a beautiful piece on Corriere della Sera yeah. uh, about culture and, uh, um, and uh, trying to explain to the Prime Minister of Italy uh, this kind of... Uh, uh, potential, enormous potential the restaurant has right now in 2020. And, uh, and culture uh, is uh, extremely important for chefs because uh, culture, knowledge, consciousness, sense of responsibility is something extremely important and steps from one to another is are very short because uh, what we do every day in our small restaurant is like we promote culture, but we, we also develop knowledge, but also we promote the step uh, to social responsibility is very short. And uh, what we do, uh, it's, uh, it's under the eyes of everyone. You know, now we have, uh, we have uh, 11, uh, almost 11, uh, because uh, it's not ready yet in New York, but then we are we have ten uh, soup kitchen, and in every soup kitchen right now we are feeding uh, uh, more than uh, 500 meals uh, every day. Just in Paris, between 3,800 and 5,000 meals a day. So imagine, you know, 
a small restaurant like Osteria Francescana, what has been able to do in five years. And the tortelli in your soup kitchen is something to talk about, huh? <laughs> a tortelli full of love, yes. especially the tortelli of Tortellante, because, ah. you know, I have an, another project that is called Tortellante, yes. in which we broke the walls uh, in our society, and we, and we said, welcome, come yes. in, <laughs> you guys the, with different abilities, and you grandmothers, that, you know, the two more marginalized yes. part of our society, the grandmothers, the old grandmothers, and the, the, the kids with different abilities, the young adults with different abilities. We put them together and we start making tortellini and uh, sell the, these tortellini to the people. They don't have time uh, to make the tortellini home. Uh, to the people, they want to be part of this amazing revolution. And uh, this is more successful than ever. Yes, absolutely. As I said, it's one of the best tortelli I've eaten, so I can vouch for it. <laughs> so, Gagan, here we have Massimo, who just talks about culture and culture as a chef, what we can do as part of the world, which is culture of not only feeding, culture <laughs> of not only uh, teaching ourselves sustainability, but also a culture of giving in some ways. Do you think we chefs who really, as I mean, you said in Bangkok, you're very lucky. And I wish Massimo would write a letter to our prime minister as well, since restaurants mm -hmm. in our country has completely been sidelined and been not given any importance whatsoever during the period of COVID. You as a chef, how do you think this COVID will make us think differently, look at things differently, and how food eating per se, whether it's a meal at home, whether it's a meal at a fine dine restaurant, or whether it's a meal just with your family, how will that change as going forward in the new post-COVID world? I think uh, a few things are very important to understand about COVID is that uh, we uh, are living in this post COVID and a road where we are waiting for hope. So if you look at a country like Thailand, my first thing when I was in a, in a, in a tourism meeting here with the different tourism ministers and all, the first recommendation I told them was, this is the time to wake up, not target 50 million tourists who pollute your country, who make your country less sustainable and just become a kind of a, I think, we have to redefine tourism, luxury, the sky is cleaner. Uh, we can go towards sustainable goals about hotel, travel, tourism and food industry. It's all combined. The thing is that the problem we were is that this third world countries in Asia started behaving first world in pocket, but not in the mentality. We don't have the mentality to live in a first world. We don't understand preserving a culture. You ask a Thai chef or an Indian chef or an Asian chef, they don't want to cook Asian food. They don't want to understand their own recipes. They are they are into like the pride Massimo carries in a grandma's cooking. We don't even have pride in a mother's cooking. A mother's also not cooking anymore. So I think this idea of preserving a culture, our history of food is completely diluted. In India, it's sad to say that we give more leverage to Chinese food than our home food. And that's a disaster. It's a pure disaster. I mean, this is what I think is a time for us to understand, to rediscover our, 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 our culture. And it's a, not a setback, but COVID is a time when you are challenged to be a survivor. You are surviving these times. No award, no fame, no number of followers can attract people to your restaurant. Nobody can travel. So it's a real challenge for every chef, every restaurant to go back and do something new in life. So rediscover. And this is one thing which I really said for a very long time. Like, how do we do? How do we go forward? Do we go back to what we were doing 
or do we rethink about our lives? We rethink about food. We rethink about creating this idea that that cooking is the most human thing. Animals and us, the only difference is that we cook. Everybody eats and we eat to have peace in life. We relax. Animals from a giraffe to a monkey to a whale to a shark will eat in aggression. Whether it's eating a banana or a, or a meat. But we eat for surviving. Yeah, we eat for having life. Okay. Food is life, beginning of life for humans. And in COVID, I think that is one thing that makes us happy eating. Yes. Yeah. 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 You still lost weight. That's another story altogether, right? And Massimo, how do you. Uh, I, I'm, I, I was writing something about culture, you know, yes. that. Uh, you know, to, just for everybody to understand, uh, you know, when we talk about culture, because people usually in general, uh, they listen to a chef that is coming out of the kitchen and talk about culture. And uh, but uh, people then culture, what is a culture for for a restaurant uh, mm -hmm. in 2020? You know, and I was writing something to understand uh, what is culture for me, you know, that is uh, is completely different from uh, the perspective of culture that people think, you know. And I was writing this now. Culture, culture is not a storage place that you have in your mind in we, uh, that we keep in there. Culture is the ability to understand life, the place where we keep all the relation that we have with other people, the relation with other human being. Um, it, the, the person who has culture, he has the consciousness of himself and, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, understand the relation to, with, uh, with other people to approach to the world. So this is culture for me. Absolutely. And it is extremely important. It's not like, oh, I know exactly what was the, con the Russian constructivism of the poetry of the beginning of the century made by this or that. It's totally different. You know, it's, uh, it's something uh, that is part of ourself and the ability to, to ask yourself questions constantly. Make yourself in a position to keep learning and evolving as a human being. Yeah. And this has been extremely important for us in this uh, special moment. Yes. You see, Massimo is really terrible for reputation of all chefs. He talks, he's a philosopher. I mean, he's supposed to be abusive. He should be throwing pans at us. And here he's talking about culture and a revolution. Massimo. <laughs> Terrible, terrible. You're putting all of us at shame. But seriously, what you said is so correct because at the end, that's what culture is. It's not something you develop. It's not something you acquire. It's not something you buy. And food, whether in every form, whether from a chef, whether from a grandmother, food has a sense of nurturing. Food has a sense of giving. And that sense, nothing else in the world can give. And if we don't learn how to develop it, even after getting the shock, I mean, everyone talks about COVID, this pandemic, as I said, has been terrible. But if we think about it, in some ways, it has also been a wake up call. It has been a wake up call for all of us that we have been treating our nature, nurture, planet, food. Listen. We have to change behavior. We yes. have to change behavior. But the behavior, you can change behavior in the world with education, uh, better food education, a better, uh, you know, a better food education means a better future for food. Yeah. It begins with our children, teaching them, uh, uh, you know, uh, to know food better, appreciate it value it you know my grandmother didn't leave me uh, didn't let me leave the table if i didn't finish my plate exactly you know but it doesn't end that there reeducating reeducating adults you know and uh, and uh, how to shop cook and eat remind the public to use their voice through what they have chosen to buy you know can we encourage a food system that 
flavor, sustainable, reinforced artisan production, relationship, respect for products and for the people who make them, the act of, the, 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 the act of cooking is also a, an ethical choice, you know? Let's start asking ourselves uh, our food, uh, where our food comes from. Yes. And now we can secure its future. Yes. Uh, it's extremely important, you know. Uh, everyone has a role to take in the field, in our kitchen, at home, in businesses, at school. It's important to be resourceful. It's important, uh, 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 you know, to pay respect to the ingredients, not to be wasteful. To have respect for, for the food that we prepare, but also the food that we eat daily. We have to be inquisitive. We must make these ethical choices part of our day life, you know? Uh, uh, when, we, when we change, when we change the, this mindset, we can get the most out of the energy and yeah. resources that go into, product, into producing our food system. We can invite uh, innovation and process that are not only ethical but healthy Absolutely. and uh, and equitable for people yeah. and uh, and the planet uh, because uh, you know to see real you know change quickly we must remember to also simplify things for people because it's too complicated everything is too complicated right. cooking is a very simple act is an act of love but it's a very simple act, you know, help them to, to take small step as I was doing in kitchen quarantine. Kitchen quarantine has never been a, a masterclass. It's been a very simple things to do every day in our home. And uh, that's why, you know, I always say that Food for Soul is a cultural project and not a charity project. Absolutely, I agree. But Gagan, I mean, what Massimo said right now, if we look at it, all our cultures, whether it's Indian culture, whether it's Italian culture, we've never had a culture of wastage. <coughs> you know, the chapati <coughs> leftover were stuffed with the vegetables next day. The chilke ki sabzi, the vegetable peels were always made into sabzis at home. So it is... Our pickling, the whole idea of pickling things into achar and everything was all about exactly. using. So basically what we have to do now is come back to basics, come back to what our mothers and grandmothers used to do and come back to reality. I think Sunetra is trying to tell me that we are running out of time, but I'm sorry, I need three more minutes, Sunetra. No, because... I have to say something. I yeah. have to say something. You know, it's not about us. Because in our restaurant, our restaurant has always to create something brand new. You know, yeah. I created a new menu in uh, Osteria Francescana for the reopening. There was explosive, you know, called with a little help from my friends. So it's like I opened the door uh, to all my team, all the people of my team. And we all together, we created a, a cultural exercise. Uh, starting from uh, the Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Art Club Band. And, uh, you know, we won every single prize that we could win uh, in Italy. You yes. know, we also get the, the fourth star, like uh, the green star. So yes. this is uh, what we do in our restaurant. By yes. now, our homes, in everyday life, we have to re-educate people. Yes. Absolutely. No, I agree. Sorry, Sunetra, I have to have some fun with the boys before they go. I mean, we have all been talking about depressive things. So a quick rapid fire. Let's start with you, Gagan. Okay, bicycle or a Ferrari? <laughs> Ferrari. Tofu <laughs> <laughs> or paneer? Ah, uh, sorry, tofu. Tofu, shame on you. And this is a million dollar question. Think twice before you answer. Ravioli or dim sum? Ravioli. Uh, good ah, good. Ah, Gagan, Gagan, Gagan. You know, know. no, listen, listen. We were, we were with Ugly Delicious, with Ugly Delicious. Yes, we were like, they, uh, Dave Chang came to me and we did uh, Dim Sum versus Tortellini. Yeah. And guess who won? Who won? 
Cos Tortellini. Cake Tortellini. Cross. Now, Gagan, your secret fantasy date. Quickly, tell us all. Your wife is not listening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> secret fantasy date. Uh, uh, Ritu Dalmia. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right answer, Massimo. What? One ingredient that you hate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One ingredient that you really hate. That I really hate. No, uh, I don't hate any ingredients. Yeah. I hate. I hate. I hate arrogance. Arrogance from the people. I Bravo. love to cook arrogant people. Bravo. Secret midnight snack. Uh, probably frozen uh, defrosted pizza. Ah, bravo. That's or a piece favorite. of parmigiano. Yeah. Indian or Chinese takeaway? Ah, both. <laughs> Never. Both. No, has to be one. I am okay, sorry. Indian. Indian. Bravo, Indian. Bravo. One historical figure you would love to cook for. Oh my God, this is uh, this is crazy. Um, Jesus Christ. <laughs> he doesn't eat. He was starving, and the last. I know. Century. That's why I want to make. I want. I would love to make the best piece of bread ever. Break it and share it with them. Bravo! And last, who's your favorite Indian woman chef? Are uh, you? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. No. Sunita is going to throw me out. Ciao, Masi. Ciao, Gagan. Ciao, Gagan. Stay safe. Be good. <laughs> and we all are going to break bread together and laugh about this exactly. year in few months and say, did it really happen? No, it did not. Take care, everyone. And thank you so much for making my day. It's really been a fabulous session and it was a pleasure to be with two of my favorite people. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much. Bye. And I must say that, you know, that session uh, among all the other uh, kind of uh, emotions that it brought out, hunger is one of them as well. It's just so much talk of yum food is just there. So thank you so much to all three of you chefs and the whole ideas that you talked about, especially at a time that most of us have been deprived of having those experiences of going out there and experiences food to hear all of uh, what you all went through and what you've been doing with your time has just been inspiring. Thanks very much. But of course, we have many other newsmakers coming up in just a few minutes. We are going to talk about education. Just how has it changed and the kind of challenges that entire sector is facing because of the pandemic that's coming up in just a bit. A vision becomes a milestone when it helps make our lives richer with love and laughter. when it helps make a cleaner, smarter, and a more beautiful planet. So that you can set off on joyous new journeys and adventures. Building stronger bonds and bridging impossible distances, which take you from the ever new to the forever beautiful. Opening up vistas and windows to a vibrant new world. A vision becomes a milestone when it touches millions of lives. Aditya Birla Group. Big in your life. Amongst the fastest developing states in India, a treasure trove of minerals, an oasis of nature's bounty, powering India's growth, adding steel to its dreams, a leader in cleanliness, virgin in its beauty, vibrant in its culture, a land of promise, 
a land of opportunities a state like none other chatisgarh thank you sonal <laughs> Everyone thanking me. <laughs> I'll tell you. When you buy an Usha sewing machine, more than one percent of the proceeds go towards empowering women in rural India through Usha Salai schools. That's why. You have ten minutes, or I'm gone. I'll take a lot less. Send in the drones. Show maps. It seems like everybody wants you. I'm born magnetic. The all new i20. Born magnetic. Rishi, hmm? ki pandit ji kya bol rahe hain? Keh rahe hain ki mujhe tumhe zindagi ke sabhi khatron se bachana hai. Phir to meri lai khatre mein hai. क्योंकि जो कॉकरोच से डर जाए वो मेरी क्या रक्षा करेगा वह कॉकरोच छोड़कर तुम्हारी पूरी लाइफ एकदम सिक्योर है स्मार्ट लोगों की क्लियर है प्रायोरिटी बाकी सब बाद में फॉर वाले रिलेशनशिप से पहले एल आई सी In India, I learned that you don't add masala just to the food. You add it to everything you do. I learned that flavor is more than a taste. It's a sight. It's a sound. It's a science. In India, I found the secret masala spices that make all the difference. The joy with which you cook. The love with which you serve. It's a human thing to want the truth. It doesn't matter if you're older or part of the youth. We certainly don't like being kept in the dark between all those lies and those question marks. But lately, it doesn't seem to bother us when they bend and break and twist and crush the truth. That's supposed to matter so much. In the race to be the first who breaks the news, they seem to have broken the news. And do you even remember the time when the news was supposed to make you wise? And now you can spend hours consuming and listening them shouting and complaining, and in the end, just feeling worse off than you did in the beginning. Which begs the question: Does all of this not trouble our generation? When they push opinions and call them facts, as we watch the fourth pillar crumble and collapse. It is a human thing to want the truth and to make every claim carry its burden of proof to expect that the first voice you hear is also the last word that's the Meet the all new Hindustan Times Now experience engage and express Hindustan Times first voice last word Welcome back. Our next session tackles one of the hardest hit areas by the pandemic, education. Never before in history have so many children at once been out of school all at once. A study that was done by UNICEF said that about a billion children are at risk of falling behind in education. In India, we hear news reports of children who are never likely to return to school even when the pandemic ends. For them, the opportunity at education is over with covid-19 there are children who used to depend on midday meals and the government has been trying to help deliver them home but has it had 100% success the digital divide has meant that the world is now divided between those that have enough data 
and a device to help stream their classes and those that simply don't have the means. And even those who have privilege and the means are now worried about the impact of online classes, the lack of physical in-person instruction. Is it going to have a lasting impact? As you can imagine, there are so many aspects to this topic and to help answer some of them, we have two excellent speakers. Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan was heading the committee that drafted the new education policy. It's a document that has been praised by stakeholders from across the country with its stress on regional languages. Currently Chancellor of the Central University of Rajasthan, Dr. Kasturi Rangan has served as a former ISRO chairman and member of Atomic Energy Commission and has also been a Rajya Sabha member. With him, we have Ashish Dhawan, a founding member of Ashoka University. He used to run one of India's leading private equity funds, Chris Capital, before quitting that in 2012 to set up a university that provides Ivy League quality undergraduate programs. In conversation with them both is HD's editor-in-chief, Sukumar Ranganathan. Over to you, Sukumar. Thank you, Sunetra. Uh, I'm delighted to have with me uh, Two people who can probably shed more light on the future of education than many others in this country. Uh, while we will talk about the pandemic, like Sunetra mentioned, much of our focus will be on uh, the new educational policy and the way forward. Um, for those of you uh, who might need a refresher on this, uh, India recently came out with a new education policy. Um, Dr. Katsir Rangan was uh, the chairperson of the committee that brought out that document. Uh, it is a visionary document with far-reaching changes. It's uh, um, received a lot of acclaim. It's been critiqued in parts, um, and, and it focuses on some very, very interesting areas, which I hope over the next uh, half an hour to 45 minutes we will be able to discuss. Um, but before that, I want to start off with uh, an easy question for both of you. It's, it's like you know a, an opening ball in a cricket over, a slow, uh, full toss outside a half stump. Um, COVID, suppose you had to envision education in the time of COVID, and this is clearly a black swan event. I mean, it's something that no one could have predicted. It's something that no one expected to happen. Sure, there were uh, projections that said like uh, the next pandemic was never too far away, but, but no one thought that it would happen now. But suppose you had to build an education infrastructure, uh, a larger framework say that would be resilient to this. What are the one or two things that you would do? Uh, Dr. Kasur Rangan, can we start with you, please? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Sukumar and Dorothy on time for this uh, unique privilege of uh, interacting. Uh, regarding the situation with regard to the COVID, there are two things that I would like to say. One is, of course, we need to address the question of uh, technology because these are things that happen with short time frames and short time frames to develop mathematical tools, scientific, we need to address the use of technology. And if you look at the address the use of technology, the question is with regard to the problem this country faces in the context of it, technology, the digital divide. This is pretty severe in the context of this. We have done quite a lot of things were done even before COVID on various aspects that became very prominent, like uh, online learning, the question of blended uh, education and things of that kind. But I think they need to be strengthened. The evaluation has shown that there are strengths in them, but there are also questions in them. And lastly, there are also weaknesses in them. And uh, therefore, we have to address this. One thing we just want is certain areas we can certainly transform our current systems into a normal mode, which we have learned out of the COVID. On the other side, we have established, for example, a new forum called the National Educational Technology Forum. And this forum can really debate, it's a deliberative uh, uh, platform, uh, should debate the futuristic aspects of technology. There are many disruptive technologies, artificial intelligence, expert systems, and things like that. The evaluation of them, their suitability for this country, adoptability, and the economics and the, all the rest of it. I think it opens up a large area of research, development, evaluation, field evaluation. I think this is something that is good has happened. Things will get accelerated. The, the policy itself makes a very specific recommendation. 
uh, with respect to this. These two things on the technology, evaluation of technology, and the coupling it with education, these are the things that I would like to say at this stage. Of course, there are the questions regarding the social part of it, the cultural part of it, whether a youngster studying in school, is it the best way to have an online education where you ultimately the man is a social animal. If you don't meet eye to eye with your teacher, there are serious problems. So are we addressing this question? There are questions in this kind of a thing. We need to do research. We need to do understand it. I think it's a matter which is a little open, even though there is a lot of debate with regard to the online access of education uh, for the youngsters, especially the, the middle school and the primary school kind of a thing. Uh, are we doing the right thing with respect to the way in which they would like to interact and learn from the teacher? It's the whole education policy also in the early phase is an interactive process. It is not it doesn't assume that you learn something out of looking at the video. It, there is an interactive process. So this needs to be assessed with respect to the technology, in the uh, uh, school education. But there is a strength in the higher education. And I think the research is also a potential on which we can use the technology. Thank you. Ashish, your comments? Yes, firstly, COVID is a, is a complete black swan, swan event. Um, it has me meant that most children will actually lose a year and they'll fall behind. So it's a tragic event as far as education is concerned. Couldn't have really planned for it because it, this is a, a once in a hundred year event. I think it reminds us that firstly, despite the hype of technology, the truth is children will always be going to school. I mean, school is much more than just sitting at home and learning online, as Dr. Kasturi Rangan was saying. And um, so that's one, the primacy of physical education and that ed tech at the end of the day will be supplementary. How could we have been better prepared? I think we, you know, if we think of a home based, we have historically not reached out to parents. So if you look at most government school teachers, they don't even have the numbers of, you know, parents, they can't reach out to them, etc. I think what COVID has done is it's forced teachers to reach out to parents. It's forced the government to think about an omni-channel approach because not everybody has access to a smartphone. So radio, TV, etc. It's forced us to think about do we have enough digital content in the vernacular? Uh, and is it mapped against a learning outcome framework? So this whole idea of a home-based curriculum that can I send something on a daily or weekly or twice a week uh, videos for children to watch, activities for them to do, etc. We were caught off guard. We didn't have this. Um, and remember, most children in India are learning asynchronously. It's only in the upper income households where there's Zoom or synchronous education. I think the flip side is coming out of this. One, there's, there's a silver lining. One is we have a better connect between teachers and parents. You know, they, they now have engaged with parents much more than ever before. They have their numbers to text message, WhatsApp, and we can take advantage of this channel, I believe, to build like a home-based uh, tech-driven curriculum. The ASA report shows that 61% of households in rural India now use WhatsApp, and I bet it's 90 plus percent in urban India. And you can mark my words that in two years, the number will be 90% in rural India. So we have a real opportunity here to send parents material for them to do with their children, for children to do practice, fun activities, etc. Let's not lose this opportunity. Let's build on this to build a home-based curriculum. And the second thing is in this COVID moment, it is very interesting that a lot of state governments have actually used, done a lot of teacher professional development online or in blended form. And I think we can do this in blended form going forward. We had incubated a, a program called Teacher App and you won't believe it that in this period, we have had a, more than a million teachers take five plus courses online. And this is something that would never have happened before. So I think we can reimagine continuous professional development. Again, it'll be blended, not just online. And we can reimagine this home based curriculum using technology. Thank you, Arjun. I think some of those points were. Very well made, and thank you, Dr. Tafsir Um I think the interesting thing, and, and this also gives me an opportunity to sort of segue into uh, NEP, which I want to be the thrust of our discussion today. Um, if we actually done some of the things that NEP had mentioned, uh, it might have actually addressed 
a few of these issues that we are facing right now, um, especially in terms of feature preparation, especially in terms of uh, uh, digitization, especially in terms of the availability of material, um, in terms of the availability of material across languages. Um, so I want to move into NEP now. And one of the very interesting areas that NEP focuses is on assessments. And there, um, India is a particularly interesting case, right? I mean, uh, there is so much of thrust on examinations, which, which means that you, you would expect it to be a very, very uh, result-oriented and an outcome-oriented approach. Uh, but yet, when you look at some of the asset readings, uh, there are still so many fundamental outcomes that are lagging. And um, there are children uh, who are in uh, grade five who can't even do a grade two problem in mathematics or, or can't compose a sentence that people in a lesser class should ideally be able to do. Uh, how do you think this problem can be addressed? Uh, Dr. Kasturam, then I'll start with you, please. Well, you know, you, you talked about the assessment and uh, what I would like to start with is the fact that uh, the national education policy really is a transformative policy, an end-to-end -end policy, and it starts with the preschool education right down to the research and PhD and things of that kind. And in, in, the, in this process, the, we had to relook at the entire process and particularly if you come to the school education, the question was, are we doing the right thing with respect to the various grades or stages of studies in the school education? What is the basis for that? If you do that part of it and go a little more detailed in the form of science or neural sciences or cognitive science, you come to the conclusion that the present early part of the education, for example, of the youngsters are mistuned with respect. It is not in tune with the kind of neurological development, the brain development that a child experiences in the early phase. It is said that by, by the age of eight, 82 percent of the brain is already developed. And do we address the question of the ability of the child to learn in an extraordinary way in this period uh, with respect to the type of education we are imparting to that child? This is where the earlier part of the education had a serious difficulty. Its implications are several. One is the fact, the, the fact is that we have to really rush through a process of learning which includes language and mathematics, for example, literacy and numeracy. And we need to see whether how much we can pack in this first eight years of the child's growth. That is the first part of it. The, the second, second part of it is every child in this, we all always assume there's a linear way in which the child learns. So if, 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 if a youngster who is eight years, say six years old, all the six year olds learn to the same extent. It is not so. The brain development is not uniform among the youngsters. We don't address this question. So the early part of the first five years, which you call the foundational period, we have addressed it with respect to the fact that you deal with a perceptual uh, thing and this perceptual thing has to be addressed with respect to individual attention. And so it needs a new way of making sure that the youngster gets graph things, whether it is on literacy or whether it is in numeracy. In fact, language can be best learned in the spirit. So this is one important thing. And if you refactor this aspect of it and you use the same thing to look at the rest of the developmental stage. So it is the developmentally appropriate education that we are giving as a pr proposal, which is related to the five year and three year and three year and four years. And if this is the kind of a thing, the primary purpose of the assessment has to be formative. The very, how is the child really learning and how well is he tuned to the kind of thing that he is supposed to understand. This is where we, we find that the primary assessment, which is to be a learning, has to necessarily go from the present practice of a summative assessment. And your assessment is based on the summative assessment, which is an assessment of learning. And it includes, therefore, examinations and other graded work. You have to go to a formative assessment, which is assessment for learning, which helps teacher identify exactly where the students are struggling. So this is the difference, the summative and the formative, this is the other part of it, which has been now factored into with the assessment where we have to shift it to the study in the formative mode, 
the students will be tested for higher order skill analysis, critical thinking and conceptual clarity, greater attention to this. And ultimately, of course, the teachers have to be trained for this kind of a thing in making use. The last point I'd like to make on this is that here the teacher's autonomy with respect to dealing with the curriculum and the pedagogy is also critical. We have discussed this question with respect to how even though we may have a curriculum and a pedagogy uh, uh, coming out of a curricular framework which is formed for the country, uh, we certainly have to adopt it depending on the teacher's experience. This is not present. Once you don't have that autonomy for the teacher, what happens is he just picks up the exam examination that comes from one place, evaluates it according to another rule. There is nothing called an assessment. You just try to check up how much the fellow has wrote or wrote, wrote memory he has carried with him and how well is he doing that part of it. This is what is not expected. So obviously the formative part of it has to take over and this also needs a special effort on our side to make sure the teachers are adept in evaluating the formative part of it and that is not a single shot process. It is a multi-state process. Uh, Dr. Kasir Rangan, quick follow up. Um, zero to eight from what you've just said and also what the policy says, uh, the first eight years uh, are clearly going to be the most critical. And that is also where clearly a lot of change needs to happen. Um, in Not just in terms of the curriculum, but also in terms of how the teachers approach the whole process. Uh, and, and probably a lot of involvement of the parents is also involved at this stage. Would that be an accurate reading of this? Yes, it, this, this, is a, this is a phase in which, for example, the, the policy says that the learning starts right from the day one, zero the child is born. Zero to three is within home. There is some prescriptions of what should be done at home. You want to optimize the learning process at home. And there are very traditional interesting ways in which the Indian uh, families do adopt certain type of things for the zero to three. The three to eight is critical. But the, crit the, the, uh, the most important aspect of that criticality is the ability to have certain types of for example, this is going to be a, you are addressing really the problem with respect to a non-structured uh, environment. The, it is not a, because it is, it is not linear as I mentioned. So you need to have specialized activity based, play based kind of a thing which will kindle the neuropsychological capability of the brain and give it the optimum thing. And the same thing, that's why importance is also given right from the age three in terms of language learning, something which was put one to six years. Now it's good. The education starts at the age of three and the three in the age of language, mathematics, so literacy and numeracy comes into picture in this particular thing. And then followed by the question of uh, making sure that all through the primary education and the higher education, we continue with the literacy, numeracy concept in some form or other. So there's the other, other part of it. And then, of course, once you go through the five years, the next two, four, three years will be most, a broader understanding of the learning process with the limited interface with the text. And then you go to a region where you are able to look at the subject separately. And finally, you are able to make even a comprehension of what you are planning for the what you are learning, what is its use, and what could be you, what do you want to be. That is the last four years. So it is structured in this way in which every stage has got a certain reason to why it is so with respect to the educational levels and the type of education that is important. The role of community, the role of parents, the role of teachers, these are all critical because of the fact that ultimately it is not going to be a progress sheet in the sense of mark sheets. It is going to be a totality of what the student is. That the future for report cards are going to be much more elaborate. And this is where the importance of parents, evaluate, ability of parents to evaluate it, try to go to school and get a feedback from the school. This whole process has to be set in motion. So I think every important stakeholder in the community will have a say in the overall context of school education in the coming years. Ashish, uh, to come back to the original question that I posed, which was on outcomes. Yeah, so I think firstly, I want to congratulate Dr. Kisturi Rangan. I think this is a landmark um, uh, document and, and policy. Uh, and we look back and say that this really changed the trajectory 
of India's education system. Because earlier it was about access and equity. Now we are really focused on outcomes and quality. I also want to mention what you said earlier, which is the primacy of foundational literacy and numeracy, which Dr. Kasuri Rangan talked about. These are the critical years. And, you know, there is a certain point, which is at age eight, you switch from learning to read to reading to learn. And if you miss that boat, you miss it forever because the curriculum moves on. And, you know, you just sit there in the classroom and everything goes over your head. Your learning trajectory flattens. So as a country, we need to be sharply focused. And this is what the policy clearly says, that this is a number one priority. It needs to be mission mode. By 2025, we need to get there. And I'm so glad that the government, the first thing that they have done coming out of the policy is actually announced this mission called the Nipun Bharat mission. The prime minister actually announced this shortly after Teachers Day to all teachers. And the prime minister himself actually set a goal saying that children should be reading at the rate of 30 to 35 words per minute, which in technical jar jargon is known as oral reading fluency uh, by age eight or class three. So that really, the prime minister has defined what the outcome or the goal is. And oral reading fluency is not sufficient. You also need reading with comprehension, but the two are tightly joined at the hip. So I think that's the goal that the country needs to shoot for, where we need every child in this country to be able to read, write, and do basic arithmetic. I completely agree with Dr. Kasturi Angan that the assessment needs to be, we need to focus on formative. We need to give the teacher the right tools so that she can assess children regularly and lift the bottom half. We will only improve our overall if we can lift the bottom. Focusing on the top, top 10 or 20 percent is not going to help us achieve our objectives. And, uh, you know, we will know where to remediate through this assessment. Of course, there is a summative assessment as well as part of this mission. There will be an, uh, a baseline next year, a midline and an end line in 2025. That's critical. But there's no point of reform if the classroom transaction doesn't change. At the end of the day, if that doesn't change, there is no reform. And so that's at the very, very core. And then beyond that, you talked about assessment reform. I think the policy also talks about reform in the higher grades, you know, particularly class 10, class 12 board exam. And I think that's fundamental as well in terms of moving away from rote learning. And believe you me, I think this will have a huge cascade effect downwards into middle school and primary school. Because the board exams are a certain way, parents start getting their children and schools start getting the children hooked onto road based learning from very early on. So I think fixing that in the higher grades also will have a huge washback or cascade effect downward. And then institutionalizing it through Parak, uh, I think will be a game changer. We need a body. If you look at all countries in the world that have successful education systems, they have a technical body that actually does this. And the policy proposes exactly that. So I think this is a landmark policy. And I'm so glad that the government is actually following through with it. Parak is being established. The Foundational Literacy and Numeracy Mission has been put forward and even class 10 and 12 board exam, at least CBSC is now considering it. So I think the ball is moving forward. I'm not going to uh, make a quick digression uh, into two areas which have obviously got a lot of press because uh, both of them are a little controversial. Uh, one of them is the whole languages thing, right? I mean, because at, at some point, uh, any conversation on education, um, you start talking about languages and then there are clearly states that have their own views on this. Um, uh, some of the southern states have, have traditionally see this as a way of the center of imposing Hindi on them when it shouldn't be there. And, and it's one, one of those endemic things. And, and, and a lot of it is political, uh, but I wanted your views on this, on languages. And, and you know, while we're talking about schools, the interesting thing is we're having this conversation on a day when, uh, I don't know whether you saw this morning's Hindustan Times, uh, where uh, the education minister uh, actually had a piece on uh, uh, the use of languages in higher education. And, and, and I thought it was an interesting piece. And I thought uh, we could probably, once we talk about schools, talk a little bit about that also. Uh, Dr. Kastir Ramdev? Yeah, I, I think 
uh, you are very uh, aptly touched upon a very it's, it's more than a sensitive subject i want to first number 3 the language in the policy is dealt with the, based on considerations beyond what the general perception is the language is dealt with with respect to the ability to learn the importance of mastering a few languages the ability to build on that capability and the necessity to on, on side appreciate the language richness of this country the importance of learning languages for our international global road and things of that kind so the whole scope of the policy framework that we have presented on languages is one which is a composite of these elements in which the language at the school stage comes into picture into focus for one reason it is not that a three language formula is new it was there in the previous testing also we have not changed the three language formula number one number two the content of the three language formula it was supposed to be only the local languages that were considered as a part of the language formula now it has got widened up into a larger number so you are really covering more number of languages as a flexibility for you to learn the third is the ability for the child to learn languages as i said 3 years to 8 years is extremely critical not only for the numeracy but for the literacy also the little the language learning is very critical at that point they have found out that if you try to stimulate those parts of the brain where the language location is there uh, then they grow faster their ability to absorb an additional inputs for the about the language and its structure and its all the scientific elements of the language is much better done and it also is carried forward by the age of age you are able to pick up more number of languages in the later years actually by investing a little more number of languages in the early years you are also investing for a longer period with a larger number of languages if you want to learn uh, japanese much much later probably if you had put enough time and enough effort into the language learning the early phase it has its implications so these are the consideration three language formula is something we have adopted we give it a more flexibility and we also know that it's a flexible because you don't have to two like two of the languages as the indian language the number one out of the two indian languages one has to be the local language mother tongue home language or it could be regional language or local language this is the other part of the thing and then you can have english or some any other language whichever you want to choose and you can start it right from the beginning at the age of eight three so there is absolutely no inhibition to learn what you want to learn you have a three language formula because three language is the minimum the brain which should be respected for its capability we are we should not do it at two or one because we are highly suboptimal with respect to its nature's gift which we should not allow that that is the reason for it and ultimately that the language formula is based on these considerations of science considerations of pragmatism and also the country's richness on language is the last point i would like to make ultimately if you know in the last 50 60 years we have lost about 220 230 languages that is a kind of a way in which it is disappearing because of non use of these kind of languages we have well, at least the 22 languages of the eight schedule have to be properly preserved even that is not that well managed in terms of education in terms of its utilization in terms of further research in these languages then there are a set of classical languages which also are extremely whether it is all the four south indian languages or pali or that kind of a thing that is the other part of it and then there is this um, there, there is the classical modern languages and then you have the classical language like sanskrit and uh, sanskrit is always looked up at in a very different context if you really look at lang uh, the richness of the sanskrit it contains much more richness than latin and greek put together that is the heritage of sanskrit running dating back to millennia and that culture we need to and culture and language are related and therefore we need to make sure that by learning language especially language like sanskrit you are enriching your system not only with respect to sanskrit the entire heritage and culture of this country and i think as india grows becomes economically strong its culturally is very important for us to 
make sure that this country's rich cultural heritage is properly understood and appreciated first by Indians themselves before we also throw it out to them. This entire purpose is all very well described with respect to the language. We need to have a translation system, interpretation system, learning system, good departments in education, both in school and higher education, where we need to create school of languages. And lastly, the ability to learn also foreign languages. We are very poor, the number of foreign language specialization available in this country is just it's, be, it's better that it's not uh, too much elaborated beyond the fact that it's highly unsatisfactory thank you ashish you want to add anything to what uh, dr kasuran said yeah all i'll say is firstly i think all research shows that children should learn in the mother tongue if they want to acquire uh, language skills and it's common sense I mean, you know, every child learns oral language to listen and to speak. That comes naturally just in the home because you're surrounded by the language, right? But you know that reading and writing are extremely hard to learn because you have to translate sound into, you know, something artificial, which is a, a, a written language that we have constructed. And that takes a lot of work. And if it's a, a language you're not exposed to at home, if you can't speak, the language, if you don't have a vocabulary, it is much harder to acquire the language. So for that reason alone, you know, we are already falling behind, like you said. I mean, it is absolutely critical that children learn in the mother tongue. Now in some elite schools, if they learn English, that's fine. You know, the parents already speak English. They may be speaking them in English. That's, that's a narrow universe. But if you look at UP, where it's largely Hindi that's spoken, and there's some variants as well, it is critical that they learn in Hindi or whatever the home language may be and then transitioning to Hindi, which is the regional language. So I think it's it's absolutely critical. And then as, as uh, Dr. Kasuri Rangun is saying also, that from a cultural perspective as well, it is absolutely critical that we preserve our languages. But in the early years, the evidence is clear. I know some states and some governments that said, let's introduce English first, make English the first language. That doesn't make sense. Actually, you're much, much better off introducing English a little bit later because the ch and allocating that time to learning the mother tongue. You know, have three periods a day for mother tongue. Learn to read first, and then it's much easier to switch to L2 thereafter. The second uh, sensitive issue that I was referring to was private education because it is one of those things that um, we, we are very, very nervous about uh, or we don't like to talk about it too much. Um, yet, like we were discussing the other day, uh, Ashish and Dr. Kasur Rangan, it, it, a lot of schools, uh, even in smaller towns, are really private schools. Uh, the challenge is improving education or effectively implementing a policy like this isn't just about working with governments, state governments. It, it, it's also about uh, providing some sort of incentives for private schools to really do these things. Uh, and Ashish, I'll come to you first. What, what, what do you think can be done in this area? Yeah, so at Central Square Foundation, you know, we primarily work with government schools, but then we look at the system and say, and, and we actually just put out a report on this, which is a very objective report, which is that 47.5% of children in the school system in India now go to either unaided or aided private schools. So almost half. In 16 states in India, 50% or more of the children go to private schools. So, you know, the train has left the station. I don't think we can unwind the clock. I think if we care about all our children, I care about all our children. I want, whether the child is in private school or government school, we want them to acquire the foundational literacy and numeracy skills. We want them to succeed in life. So I think we need to look at the private system and say that, look, they play a role. Uh, I don't think we should, um, uh, they, there should be much greater transparency within the private system. Uh, I wouldn't call them bad actors. Some are bad actors, but I think many of them are actually doing a service to children. But we need greater, we should give them greater autonomy. So lower the regulation, get rid of the license Raj, but we should insist on greater autonomy and greater account, greater transparency and greater accountability from them as well so that parents are informed and have uh, proper data before they decide where their children should go to school. 
I think it's also important to think about the incentives we create for private school owners to want to improve their schools. Uh, right now, if you look at just for household effects, actually private schools don't perform too much better than government schools. And so I really think that, and it's partly because they're really, what they're showing is that the fact that the teacher shows up and there's greater accountability or there's a computer in the school, you know, et cetera. So I, I think it's very, very important that we create the right incentives for them. And the last point I'd like to make is we must remember that the private schools we think of are not the private schools of India. 70% of children go to schools where the fees are 1000 rupees or less per month. 45% of children go to schools where the fees are 500 rupees per month or lower. These are budget private schools and average school size about 200 children. And so it's these schools, often, you know, these uh, ramshackle schools, uh, which really we need to figure out a way for them to improve quality uh, as well. And this is a real challenge going forward. But we need to carry them along and create the right incentives uh, and ensure that transparency exists because we want all children to succeed. So, uh, role of private sector, role of private schools, private colleges, what is your view on this? Uh, well, first of all, I should say that Ashish beautifully summarized the issues related to this and he has really clarified many things. In fact, that uh, policy is in tune with the kind of things that Ashish mentioned about the outlook for the private schools. I want to say one important thing. First is on the regulatory framework, we have kept, we have brought the private school and public schools at the same level. There is an even handedness we deal with. We are not dealing with them separately. This is the most important thing we should say. Then the regulatory aspects, if we take away from inputs to outcomes, there is no reason why whatever is the thing that is to improve the quality of the private school that will automatically should come in and this is an expectation and if one looks at all the kind of light but tight part of it and the parameters that are now specified what the public school would have whether things like whether the safety security uh, probity in finances or sound process of governance they are applicable to both if you just do it and the only thing is as Ashish rightly mentioned it has to be transparent it is in the public domain and of course then there are many things which are common to all the schools the TET qualification is critical, elevating the teachers of the school teachers to higher educational institutions over as getting the BED and other qualifications are concerned. And then most importantly, I also want to say that the policy allows you to share the resources between public institutions and private institutions. So there can be agreement on this. So all the policy has given enough thought to make sure that public school and private school can compete on even grounds together. And then the effort from the government system will be to make sure that we make the public school uh, as, as a best, best place to go as good as what if there is a perception with regard to the private school. But that gives an incentive also to the private school to make sure that they come up to this guy, the, the, the other side. So on the whole, I want to say and I agree with Ashish that there is no difference that we have made in the policy with respect to private and even though there are conflicting interpretation to this policy, I want to use this forum to say that some saying that there is a privatization that the policy supports and then there is two other part, the group says that they, 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 under the support for the public institutions, the private is neglected. I think neither is true. I think it's a very balanced and very well nuanced um, policy. And we have given a lot of thought to this question because we knew it will come up. We, in fact, pose the question first before formulating the policy. Thank you. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I want to raise another issue, which is a critical part of uh, what the policy says. And this is about the FIUP and the integration of edition, uh, education at the college level, right? I mean, you, you, where you want to sort of broad base uh, college education, at least in the initial year. Uh, Dr. Kassim your views on this, please. The most important thing about the thing is that we have wanted that we because the debate is with respect to whether we should go for a holistic and a, 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 a multidisciplinary education. The, the present context we call it as a liberal education. And what do we do about the liberal education? Now, there, there are enough amount of evidence with respect to the multidisciplinary courses, which Ashoka does quite a lot of this kind of a thing. 
then there are the, there are also areas where uh, uh, multidisciplinary work has been done but not as a part of the education but as a program i myself had a thing on the western guard which needed all kinds of inputs coming into it it is not really an environmental issue not a forest issue it was not a financial issue developmental issue cultural issue social so you can see the dimensions in which we need to address i think today's graduates who come out of the colleges do not have the ability to look at it in a comprehensive fashion you need to have the ability to integrate knowledge of different dimensions and come to a conclusion which is an which is a, the real situation because by leaving out some of the dimensions in the analysis the conclusions can be very misleading so the whole idea is to create a method of more creating more creative understand the complex problem that you are we are faced with in the even at the undergraduate level and the way the job seekers are also looking for today the law the job providers they want to they not only ask for a very in depth understanding of a particular subject they also look at the ability of dealing with that in depth subject in the broader dimensions of other other areas and that is becoming more and more important keeping all this in mind Uh, we have recommended this uh, thing with respect to the undergraduate education a four year education which should fulfill this kind of a thing there will be an under, the, the the what you may call as a uh, the, the liberal education you can have the majors and minors things kind of a thing exiting and entry policy also has been made flexible with respect to this four and most importantly also the work work the the what you may call as the work, the the, the edu professional education and also the 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 the, uh, the skill education both of them have been also brought into the higher education system and you can have a bachelor of vocational uh, education and you can have also the uh, professional education of the long run whether it is medicine whether it is law or agriculture should form a part of this uh, total edu educational ecosystem this is the totality of what we have recommended it has to go in stages but integration of subjects and ability to create a holistic and multidisciplinary approach to education at the undergraduate level will be the most critical in the immediate uh, future uh thank you very much um i think we can go on and on i mean there are several issues i have not touched upon i have not touched on governance i have not touched on vocational education uh but we are out of time it's been a fascinating discussion and i do hope we get to sit down with the two of you again and discuss some of these issues sunetra back to you thanks very much and that uh, session really uh, provides us with an insight in and clarity about how the new education policy is going to define uh, our children's future and education over the next few years thanks very much for that we're not done just yet we have another very newsy interesting session coming up the one with sports andre agassi and steffi graf are up next so stay tuned A vision becomes a milestone when it helps make our lives richer with love and laughter. When it helps make a cleaner, smarter, and a more beautiful planet, so that you can set off on joyous new journeys and adventures. Building stronger bonds. and bridging impossible distances which take you from the ever new to the forever beautiful opening up vistas and windows to a vibrant new world a vision becomes a milestone when it touches millions of lives aditya birla group big in your life Amongst the fastest developing states in India, a treasure trove of minerals, an oasis of nature's bounty, powering India's growth, adding steel to its dreams, a leader in cleanliness, virgin in its beauty. 
vibrant in its culture a land of promise a land of opportunities a state like none other chatisgarh thank you sonal <laughs> thanking me <laughs> i'll tell you when you buy an usha sewing machine more than 1% of the proceeds go towards empowering women in rural india through usha silai schools that's why thank you so much you have 10 minutes or i'm gone i'll take a lot less and in the drones show maps It seems like everybody wants you. I'm born magnetic. The all new i20. Born magnetic. Rishi, hmm? ki pandit ji kya bol rahe hain? Keh rahe hain ki mujhe tumhe zindagi ke sabhi khatron se bachana hai. Phir to meri lai khatre mein hai. क्योंकि जो कॉकरोच से डर जाए वो मेरी क्या रक्षा करेगा वो कॉकरोच छोड़कर तुम्हारी पूरी लाइफ एकदम सिक्योर है स्मार्ट लोगों की क्लियर है प्रायोरिटी बाकी सब बाद में फॉर वाले रिलेशनशिप से पहले एल आई सी In India, I learned that you don't add masala just to the food. You add it to everything you do. I learned that flavor is more than a taste. It's a sight. It's a sound. It's a science. In India, I found the secret masala spices that make all the difference. The joy with which you cook. The love with which you serve. It's a human thing to want the truth. It doesn't matter if you're older or part of the youth. We certainly don't like being kept in the dark between all those lies and those question marks. But lately, it doesn't seem to bother us when they bend and break and twist and crush the truth. That's supposed to matter so much. In the race to be the first who breaks the news, this Welcome back. You're watching the Hindustan Times Leadership Summit. and if education saw things being turned upside down that the world of sports was no less spectator sports came to a grinding halt since covid-19 one after another we saw wimbledon french open all the big tournaments being cancelled ipl has started but they're all working from bubbles and playing to empty stadiums in fact when top rank novak djokovic organized a series of exhibition matches the world watched with horror as it became an infection hotspot now if there's anyone who knows how to deal with challenging situations it's our next guest steffi graf and andre agassi are the original tennis royalty couple between the two of them they have 30 grand slam titles and if you read agassi's excellent memoir it tells you how he overcame debilitating back pain while winning them Steffi Graf remains the only player to win Wimbledon, the French Open, the US Open and the Australian Open at least 4 times. She's the first and, only, and still only woman player to achieve the Golden Slam by winning all four Grand Slam singles title and the Olympic gold medal in the same year. After retirement, she founded Children for Tomorrow, a charity focused on providing psychological help for children and families. who have suffered trauma her husband andre agassi has earned 60 men's singles title and is the only male player ever to win all four grand slam titles and an olympic gold medal in 94 at the age of 24 he created the andre agassi foundation for education which opened a tuition free public charter school and graduated its first senior class in june 2009 with a 100% college acceptance rate together both of them embody the principle of not just excellence and success but also giving back to the community they are in conversation at today's summit with eminent sports writer ayas memon ayas it's over to you thank you sunetra 
it's, it's really a privilege and uh, obviously one of the highlights of my career that I'm speaking to Steffi and Arde today. Uh, I won't go through the list of titles that they won, the achievements. You you mentioned them quite uh, you know uh, succinctly and obviously covered everything. But I must kind of tell them both that I watched Steffi Graf win the uh, gold medal at the 1988 Seoul Olympics. I was a, as a, I was a reporter there, and then, and then I watched 1992 Ante Agassi win the Wimbledon title. I think that was his first. So you know I've been keeping a watch on what what these two have been doing, so to speak. Uh, but to come very quickly to uh, you know first question, uh, Andre and Steffi, uh, we are living in very unusual times. The pandemic. This is something that we've never seen earlier. Probably never see in our lifetimes. Uh, are you all home birds? Are you all the out you know outdoors type? How have you all coped with with living in your own kind of lockdown scenario? Uh, it's it's tough. But can you share some experiences? Yeah, well, I, I tell you, it's been tough uh, across the board, you know, for the entire world, for the sporting world. Um, I've been very thankful that I've been heavily involved in education because there's there's been a good outlet for me to figure out some solutions and, and the schools that I've managed to, to build. But I can sure tell you this time has caused us to uh, all have to come together by sort of being separate, you know, and that, that hasn't been the easiest thing in the world for anybody. It's made us... Uh, better cooks at home, no question. Uh, you know, it's, it's made us closer as a family in, 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 in many ways. Um, but but there's, no, there's no secret answer to something no one has, has experienced before. Yeah. I saw a wry smile on Steffi's face when you mentioned that you've become a better cook or it's made better, better cooks of, of, of us. But any secret sauce he's developed, Steffi? In this, no, in this. you know what? I mean, we, you know, there, there's been, it's been a lot of struggles on a lot of ends, like us not being in person with you today. But, you know, it does have benefits of having the, the, the kids a little more at home. And there's been a lot more family time from, you know, taking hikes and taking walks together, spending, you know, a lot of quality time, especially with our oldest going off to college here soon. So, you know, we're trying to take the positives, but, uh, you know, when you look around the world and the, 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 the struggles that uh, from, from uh, you know, working to health, um, you know, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's tough. Yeah. What does it mean for tennis players at the elite level if you miss out on six, eight, eight months, maybe a year, uh, you know, because of something which, frankly, very few people have understood what's happening in the world around them? And then you, you suddenly confronted with this. I was reading an article of uh, Simone Biles, the gymnast from uh, from the United States, and she's missed out a year on the Olympics. And she said, you know, just coping with that thought, you know, will I still be able? Because she was prepared to win mentally a medal in in 2020. Now she was she, in that article. It came through. She was not sure whether she would be mentally all there for the 2021. Just going internalizing the old delay. How do you think athletes, athletes at this, at the, you know, at the elite level like you all have been? What does it mean to be moved away from the sport for such a long period? Well, I think the most difficult part about all of it for any athlete really is the unknowing, right? Because we're always so used to working backwards from goals and objectives, and and not knowing when you're going to be able to play or what the circumstances are going to be that you're trying to prepare for, both mentally, emotionally, physically, what it's going to look like. You know, that unknowing creates the level of angst. And so you have to, you know, it's a struggle sort of knowing where to give yourself breaks and where to where to push yourself. Um, you know, I I'm, I got to say, I'm I'm glad I never. Whoa, did we just lost light in here. Um, I'm just going to wait. Let me see if I can get the lights back on. Hold on. I, I got to walk over here. And get the, yep. Uh, right. back. <laughs> lights went off. Uh, but, you know, sorry, these are the these are the the things we adjust for in these crazy <laughs> times. Um, but, you know, so that's been a big deal, you know, not knowing when to play. So I call it sort of a, a great equalizer, if you will, you know, because you, you take somebody who's the best in the world at something, they know how to get themselves in perfect place to do, you know, obviously what they need to do. Now, all of a sudden, they don't have this information. They don't have, it's all new. So you get out there with no audience, and then all of a sudden the person that gets a little bit more nervous in a big environment is kind of dealing more with a calm environment. And, and so I kind of have seen this be a quite a big 
a great equalizer across many sports. And then you have those that are at an interesting time in their career where it's a real disadvantage. Yeah. You know, the players that are older, you look at a, a Federer or maybe even a Serena, and you start to you start to realize that missing this kind of time, um, you know, it, it tricks your body. Your body's getting older quicker because you're much older. And, and all of a sudden you're asked to just kind of shut down and then restart. Uh, not going to be not going to be easy for some more than others. The younger enthusiastic ones that have that uh, engine that can keep pushing their body and their mind uh, yeah. might just be the right time for them to to float to the top. So let me switch to the other end of the spectrum, Steffi. And, you know, we've talked about the elite athletes, but what about kids, six, seven year olds, eight year olds who are trying to grow into a sport, naturally irrepressible. They just want to run around and, you know, roll in the mud and kick around whatever else. And then suddenly uh, they're locked up, you know, and yeah, then, exactly. I mean, you yeah, played at a very early age, so did Andre, and you probably know what it took to start so early. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the, we've, I mean, the, you know, being locked up if you don't have this space or if you're not allowed to go out, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of kids have found the way outside, you know, back on the streets, you know, kicking around maybe a ball or, you know, I've seen the, the you know, the, the interest of people walking now. I mean, I, we have three dogs at, ha at, uh, at home and so, I'm always out walking, walking, and now I see suddenly so many more people being out there and seeing a lot more kids out there. It, it was tough for a little while when when all the playgrounds were were closed, and you know, but you do see kids suddenly being out on the street and hiking and playing with each other. Um, but you know, even as we we realize with with education with sports. Um, you know, it it it's been it's been a, a real challenging time, and and parents that usually would be at work, you know, you're having work to work from home, juggling the the families, and and um, you know, a lot of friends that been 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 really having a hard time with uh, you know being there for the kids. Um, suddenly having to to learn school from home, but also having to work. Um, you know, it's it's you know it's 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 just open up a, a, a you know just a completely different side. But I think one of the things that we've we've realized is how important it is to to concentrate on your health, especially with the kids. You know, get them get them um, you know moving, get them understanding the the right kind of foods. Maybe concentrate on those things in in that during this period where um, you know it's most important. Yeah, well, the dynamics of lifestyle, lifestyle dynamics have certainly undergone a change. Uh, but let me just now reflect or let me just kind of probe a little on how, you know, the, your your two personalities have kind of come together and then stayed. Let me first ask Steffi this. I mean, some of you achieved really busy in heights, uh, you know, Sunetra at the start mentioned all the titles you won and, and stuff. And in all versions of the game, perhaps more than any other, you know, uh, female tennis player of your time and certainly of perhaps of all time. And yet you seem to move away from the life, uh, limelight in a jiffy. <laughs> you know, you were there and then you were gone. How did you, yeah. I mean, how did it happen? How did you manage that? A lot of people would clamor. I mean, they hang on for a lifetime, you know, but you well, just seem I've, to give it all yeah, up. Yeah, but I, I think yeah. and, and through my career, I showed that I've been you know, maybe more of a reserved and, and private person. So I think it was an easy transition for me to, you know, to to move away from the career, even though I, I happen to be a lot more on the tennis court again, which I didn't quite expect, but in a, in a different capacity. But, uh, I don't know. If I don't know. Well, we, got, we got a little feedback here of a lot of noise. I don't know. If somebody yeah. can manage that, I think that's again. gone. I think okay. that's gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. So, so it, you know, I really look forward to the to time after my career. I did something, you know, from when I was four years old, and it it was such a big of part of my life. It I gave it all. I I uh, cherished so many moments. 
it is, uh, you know, uh, it, the, the sport does take complete control of you, of your life. And I think I was really ready for, uh, you know, a... a um, me. Yeah, for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I was ready and I was looking forward to it. And I think that that was the biggest thing. I, I loved what I did. I gave it all and I was ready for, um, you know, yeah, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm a, I, this is something which I read somewhere and I must ask first of all the veracity, Andre, and then you can tell us, you know, what you meant and whether Steffi agrees with you or not. You said that she, that Steffi was a step in the right direction for me. I was a step in the wrong direction for her probably. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 it's all. Did you say that? I felt, I felt that way many times. Let me, <laughs> let me, let me, let me say that. I, I think that um, there's no question that, you know, when you go through life um, the way we both did, uh, you know, we, we both lived uh, challenging childhoods. We both lived challenging careers. We both uh, bonded very quickly, but we're also you know, two entirely different uh, personalities, which I think uh, we highlight each other's uh, weaknesses and we complement each other's strengths in many ways. And and so <clears throat> we win more more than we lose. We don't, you know, we. I'm not I'm not regretful for one day. I can promise you that. And do you agree with him, Steffi? Totally, totally. <laughs> now, you know, and and I keep on saying, you know, the sport gave us the, you know, each other. It gave us. Uh, our families, our life, and the ability to choose the time and how to to spend it, and and uh, really appreciate what we have. And then, if you think about it, how I really win is if she leaves me, I get half of everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's not going to happen. So you know, you can, no. <laughs> you can talk the cars, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> no, please don't. No. I'll come to the charities because that's a very important part of your lives that you have been doing in your individual capacities as well as together. But I wanted to address a couple of more questions on, on both of you all started very young. And uh, does that in some way uh, kind of put more pressure as you keep growing? Uh, I mean, I know today to become an elite sports person, you have to start young. You can't start at 18 and 20 and become a champion. It's not going to happen in any sport. But does that kind of, because it takes away a lot of your life, which other people live ordinarily, and you live in a kind of a biosecure bubble, so to speak, much before anybody else, does that, or does it matter? Because the rewards are enormous, the fame is there, the money is there, etc. So this hardship is acceptable. How do you see it? Well, that's a great question. You know, I think the most important thing for any person to do, uh, starting with a parent, is to really define what success really means because if it's about money or if it's about being the best in the world at some at a sport you know then you're you're making a choice that 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 is that is pretty it's pretty tough because you spend a third of your life not preparing for two thirds of your life and yeah. I, and I, and I think that that's an, that's a, a very overlooked uh, reality that happens when you start so intensely you know, in sports. So, so the balance is, is, is crucial else, else it becomes very, you know, one dimensional. And that's why you see a lot of people struggle in, 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 in retirement, you know, and, and I think that's part of the reason. And I know we'll get there at some point why I got into education because I felt like my lack of choice being forced into tennis at a young age and out of school um, kind of left me very disconnected with my life and during my career at a, one of my lowest points is when I decided to, you know, give children with no choice that opportunity. And and so, I, you know, I feel like I was more lucky than I was prepared because yeah. getting involved in this gave me a platform to move forward with my educational objectives. And, and, and I'm going to get, we got to figure out a way how to get these lights on. Amy. Amy. <laughs> I don't know how to. There we go. Uh, so, you know, so for me, I think I was more lucky than good because creating those educational opportunities for kids who really don't have choice in their life gave me the bridge for, for later. But but yes, when you want to be great at something at a young age, uh, which most sports does require 
early involvement, it does come with a price. But once we had our children, you know, I feel like our careers were over with, so to speak. So we got a chance to raise them too. Yeah. So this is when those scales kind of yeah. got more balanced. So Stephanie, does that resonate with you or your experience? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, there's so much you get taught um, in, in, in tennis or in, in a sport if you're, you know, there, there's a big part that's missing and a big part that you, that you gain. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, there's a lot of challenges, but I, I do have to say there's a lot that helps you, you know, later in, in, in your next sort of career. I mean, it's unusual if you think about it. People start, you know, normally their careers when they're 28, 30. We already have been through a career. So we're, we're, we're now in, a, in, you know, a completely different phase, but suddenly, you know, and I, I see it with a lot of the players and a lot of the, the, the girls that are close to retiring that have questions, okay, where am I go from here, right? Because, you know, tennis has been all that you've known and, uh, you know, and it is focusing on all that you've learned in that, in that phase, but it is not a traditional education that you uh, walk away from. And, uh, so it does have other challenges, but like I said earlier, the benefit and like Andre just mentioned, the benefit of us now being able to dictate, you know, our times, spending more time with the kids and, you know, working on certain hours, having the freedom of, of working, you know, and choosing our work. Yeah. Also, what's happened, and uh, Andre, you were amongst the first who actually quite candidly spoke up about it, and this is now becoming a norm across sports, across disciplines, where athletes are talking about mental health. A lot of them are admitting to depression. You know, the perception from the outside for for almost as long as I could remember till, till the last maybe 10, 12 years was that, hey, if you played sport, you know, you actually became mentally tough and strong. And, you know, <laughs> you've conquered everything. And what is what is there to kind of feel depressed about? You know, it in fact prepares you uh, for the most challenging situations in life. So how do you see that? What is what is the reason behind all this? Well, uh, you know, I listen, I think that you're right in the sense that sports teaches you how to problem solve. It teaches you how to, how to build a very strong, a very strong muscle. But it's a lot like the body. If you're only building one muscle, there's an imbalance. Yeah. And, and, and that imbalance is uh, is very difficult. So so you, you give your entire self to a sport 24 hours a day where you, where even rest is just as important as as training and and you, so your whole day becomes about one thing and then you get out there and there's always immediate feedback immediate feedback places to improve things to work on and then all of a sudden when you unplug this activity you know it's almost like um, a PTSD you know post traumatic stress syndrome it's like all of a sudden, you're not getting the, the input. You're not getting the, the outlet of this intensity of, of engagement. And, and I suppose it's a bit like drugs and then no drugs. Life seems boring if you're not you know, doing it anymore. Yeah. And, and, and this feeling is a, is a different part of a person's muscle. Being able to be at peace with quiet, realizing there's a different rhythm to life now. You know, this takes time to build up the balance of, of the mind, you know, just like it does the body. So yes, sports makes you tough from one perspective, but it also, uh, from the other perspective, um, puts you in a position where you, you, you need to, uh, you need to disconnect and you need to grow a different muscle. And, and I think it takes some time for some athletes. Yeah. And uh, Steffi, you coasted through your career, uh, you know, I um, posted. That, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy that you can. That's the that way you, it looked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that you, that you um, feel like that, that's the way it looked, but oh, I mean, you know, it. No, but you were, I, you were observed. I mean, one never got the impression that you had anything but well, single. Uh, you well, know. I, I, I was a good actress then, and maybe that should be <laughs> something that I should get into. But um, oh, I've had my ups and downs and challenges, and and uh, you know, tennis every day. You go out on, on you know on the court, and you you know you you strive to reach you know your limits, and it's it's um, 
it's it's difficult because um, you know to find that emotional balance. You know, you might have it physically, but sometimes emotionally, um, you know, it's 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 uh, it's it's hard to day after day to to ask the best of you and. Um, you know, you 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 have especially um, as you, when you get on, uh, you know, closer to the top. I mean, the the, the expectations, the the demands that you have, the yeah. you know, you you don't always feel that way, but you got to, you know, you got to still ask always the best of you, and um, that is really hard, and and you don't realize the amount of pressure and the that. The, that sometimes you ask of yourself, not even from the outside, but that you, you know, that the perfectionism that you have within you, um, that once you walk away from the sport, you, you don't, you know, understand really what you've been through. Um, it, it might, you know, you always try to, to, to have that calmness, but you're far from having that equilibrium that, that you, you hope. But. But do you think, Andre, do you think more and more athletes should come out and talk about mental, you know, mental health issues and social issues? And you know, yeah, I I believe that somebody needs to be true to themselves, you know. And in order to be true to themselves, you have to you have to be self-aware. In order to be self-aware, you know, this has to be something you prioritize in your life. And and we all, uh, when we struggle, we all find our own forms of distraction, you know, and, and athletes um, pour a lot of this distraction into the intensity, as Steffi was speaking about, about with their training and with, you know, you're, you're always being measured by somebody else. And so when you're out, when you're off training by yourself, you know, you don't know what somebody else is doing. So you keep asking the most of yourself without going too far. And, and so, you know, if you... If you have the ability to, to to slow down and to understand what you're feeling, um, yeah, I do believe it's healthy. Listen, we all live different experiences, but in my heart of hearts, I believe we all live the same journey. You know, it's just like what we're going through now with the pandemic. I mean, yes, it's nice that technology allows us to connect uh, a little bit, but we all know that real connection is very important in life. I mean, the human touch, the the eye to eye, the the you know the in person, right? And and so these things are are are, are crucial to everybody, and and we all struggle. It might look like a, a beautiful bed of roses because you're holding a trophy, but I I can assure you that the the pain and suffering that goes into it, um, you know, creates the same anxieties in all of us. So if you're able to make sense of that, and that's why I decided to write my book. Because I yeah. wanted to understand my struggles and to, and and to express it, not that other people understand me, but that through me they might understand themselves better, you know. And, and so that's that that was the objective. But yes, a hundred percent, I believe everything should be transparent in our journey uh, here because it can only help each other to know that we're not alone in it. Yeah. That's very profound, and I, I I must mention here that I've read the book. A few times, not just once, and it was it was very very. You know, every time you read it, you find something interesting and new. So I from because I follow sport across disciplines, not just tennis, and it was of great interest for me to understand. You know, in, in fact, it was revealing that you know champions would also be subject to so much pressure and stuff. But so just continuing that before I come to the the charities, Steffi, sport is you know you have to confront reality within a day. I mean, you don't have a lifetime. You enter a tournament, you lose in the first first match, you're gone. You know, yeah, yeah. you win a time, tournament, you win a Grand Slam, the next time you enter the court, you might lose. So you, it, it can be very cruel at times, while it is also always fulfilling if you win, but it can be extremely cruel. And it's a harsh reality check almost every time you enter the court or any other arena. So is that something that frays your nerves, does that prepare you better for life's challenges? How do you see it philosophically? Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I think you, you, you learn to put things in perspective. And, um, you know, when you, when you were just talking about, I mean, the, we, we were lucky that we were in a, in a sport. Honestly, you know, you talked about earlier uh, um, um, 
about a gymnast that has maybe once every four years a high, you know, a, a, a very important uh, competition. And we as a tennis players, you know, luckily, we have so many chances throughout the year. We have from the Grand Slams, we have the, the, the big master tournaments. So we, there, there, there is like, you know, if we don't do well, at least we have, you know, the next week to make it up. The challenge is, uh, um, you know, you do really well. There's only a very short period where you able to enjoy the victory. You gotta and prove I think it again. you have to prove it again. <laughs> yeah, you have yeah. to prove it again. You're back on the court. So I think that learning that through our our, our career have give, has given me, I think, you know, a, a perspective of the highs and lows to not um, you know, lift them as strongly and, and you know, take them as important as, um, you know, some might see it from, from the outside. And I believe taking that back to, to our lives now, you know, is, I think, you know, take it in literally day as a day. Don't, you know, look too far forward. Don't look too far back. You know, learn from the past, but don't live in it as well as, try to take the moment and I think that's I think that what has my sport probably taught me most that's is, well said it's like it's taught us to live in the present yes you know because the present is the only chance you have at your future anyhow in the past there's no control over it so that's yeah. that's well said stuff okay so uh, tennis players are not you know usually big on political statements but for 20 years <laughs> Epi Graphs Children for Tomorrow has been working with children with mental health issues and been holding outpatients clinics for free in Hamburg, for example. You know, I mean, so how did this come about? I mean, you know, the need to do something for the underprivileged or the you know not so so blessed, so to speak. Uh, but it also is a in a sense a political statement. You know, I mean, something that the state could take care of or other you know powers that be. That's correct. Yeah. Well, I mean, I got, I got into giving back. I mean, uh, one of again, one of uh, the things that uh, you come to realize traveling the world through your sport is the inequalities that do exist. I mean, it's it's, uh, you know, you know, we we do see the tennis court here. We we do see also the the surroundings. We we travel the world and. Um, you know, I gave back in different ways till I um, met uh, one of the professors in Hamburg at the at, uh, the university that uh, in helping the inner the the children with the inner wounds that ones are not as visible and. He uh, he took me to to um, to meet some of the childrens and and hearing what they've been through and uh, the challenges that they've had uh, uh, coming through war torn from war torn areas, uh, enduring incredible violence, traveled you know um, you know long distances to to just um, escape escape what they had to endure at at home and. Uh, and just just learning about the work he was doing and the difficulty of highlighting the inner wounds that when we look at the war torn areas, you know, we do see the destructions, but we don't see really what's what's going on, you know, within the children, the the families, the the people living in it and having to to start a new life and and uh, and often, unfortunately, you know, creating you know something that's created as a, as a new cycle of of violence. So. I, I wouldn't say that I'm involved in the political, um, I don't, it's not a political statement, but the work that we're doing is providing therapy for, for these children. So I, I see it more as a, the, the humanitarian uh, side, but obviously the, the you know, it, it, you know if, you, if you look at the numbers now, we have only almost 80 million displaced people around the world that's double from 10 years ago, that obviously has a political background. Absolutely, yeah. yes. I mean, this it, it is, but I'm trying to concentrate on, on, on the most vulnerable, the children that have to, to, to grow up in, in, in the, those surroundings. 
So, uh, you know, Andre, actually, whatever Steffi said, and she said she's not kind of the backdrop may be political, but she's not into political activism, so to speak. That said, actually, women tennis players have been more politically alive or vibrant, if I may say so. You know, for instance, Naomi Osaka on Black Lives Matter, Billie Jean King, Martina Navratilova on gay rights, etc., etc. Men seem less likely to rock the boat. I mean, I know you've, you've done a book which has rocked, you know, which, which kind of caused a flutter. But generally, men tennis players seem to be cocooned and say, you know, why should we take a position? How do you explain that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't, you know, um, when I see men and, and women and how they choose to conduct themselves, you know, it, I, it's, it's, a, it's always a question to me why somebody isn't um, very clear and, and, and have a perspective, whatever it, it, you know, it, it may be. I mean, um, I've always lived uh, taking chances with how I felt, uh, regardless how it was received. And in a lot of ways, I made a lot of mistakes in that process, but I think ultimately it connected me with people more authentically. And as a result, there's a lot of good that comes from the exploration of these conversations, as long as they're done through the paradigm of compassion. You know, I, I think the mistake comes when there, when these conversations are had and with- honesty. Uh, yeah, honesty. But these, these conversations need to happen you know, in a in a in a in a vibrant way, and and in a compassionate way, in an authentic way, and 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 an honest way, and and I respect those that are willing to to approach it that way. I mean, I re totally respect Osaka for for how she felt to, feels about Black Lives Matter. Of course, they do. The statement itself. Now, does she know what 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 it really is? I don't know. You know, but does she? Maybe she does. Maybe she doesn't. But the discussion needs to happen. Yeah. But this is interesting, you know, as a, as a, as a kind of combination of Andre Agassi and Steffi Graf. So I, I did mention what I did about men's tennis players, but Andre has been an exception in many ways. And while he's been very open about his, yeah, I keep coming back to the word open, but, uh, you know, he's been very open about his life, his struggles, his, you know, problems, uh, not once, but twice over. You've been very reticent about anything. I mean, you've shared some experience <laughs> now. So is this a kind of a yin and yang, you know, settlement that, you know, I need to be cocoon, you, you be the guy who keeps talking, but maybe there are lots of similarities in, in you know, the thought process, which we don't know about. Is, there, uh, is, is, this a, is this a kind of formula that has been worked out or, or what? <laughs> yeah. You know, I I think we we uh, we came together at a time when I think we we knew knew each other pretty well already. You yeah. know, and I think you know, um, like you said, I mean, there might be certain differences uh, in 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 how we handle things and personalities, but in all of the right things, I find that we are we have very similar thoughts and and. Uh, I think that um, our priorities are very aligned and, um, you know, even with raising kids, I think you learn so much about each other and that maybe we didn't realize uh, when, when we, you know, starting to know each other. But I think, you know, it's, it's uh, when we realized, you know, how much we were aligned in, in some of the thoughts and, and, and things, the way we, 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 uh, we have our values um, aligned and um, so I, I feel like it's you know between the, the values the respect for each other and the trust in each other um, yeah I, I, it, it's working really well let's put it that way yeah, I think, uh, when you talk about yin and yang I think uh, I think there's just a lot to be said for being attracted to what you respect and what you're not you know the discipline she's always shown in her in her career, you know, is is something that 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 obviously my personality uh, couldn't abide. I always had to go through my emotional process, yeah. and 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 even though it was an emotional process for her, her personality and skill set allowed her to go about it differently, and and that's attractive. You learn, you know, it's like it's it's the same, but it's different, and and I think I think she's gotten me to be a lot a lot more um, thoughtful 
before um, I just I react and yeah. and and and, be, and, and, I've honest, become, and I've become a little more open. Uh, yeah. In <laughs> other words, she wouldn't have done this 20, 22 years ago. She wouldn't. <laughs> so hopefully, so it's been a good impact. Am Am I to understand that you know the arguments in the house are won by Steffi now? That's it. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. <laughs> But okay. I gotta say, there is a discipline to um, to not reacting, you know, yes. um, and 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 I think tennis has taught us both that. So if we have a pressure moment where we might not see things eye to eye, our our reaction is not to react. It's right. to it's to. So that's yeah, been a big absolutely. help. So that's a great learning from sport, isn't it? That you've been in that process hundreds of times in your careers, and then you say you sense that. Issue coming up and say, hang on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need, a, I need to take a little 30 minute break. 30 seconds. Yeah. Okay, let me get down to, let me come to the, uh, you know, Andre Agassi Charitable Foundation in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, both of you all are in, in, into that. So, and from all accounts that I've read since I had to do the session, I was also reading on the work has been exemplary. So, just tell us a little bit of the background, what started, what are you, What's been the outreach? Where do you see it going ahead? Yeah, so so I did touch on it a little bit as to my motivation, why I felt like my lack of choice in life was a big deal. And when I saw a show in 60 Minutes that showed these kids who have no choice in their life because they didn't have an equal education, this was unconscionable to me. So I took out a big mortgage, a $40 million mortgage. I built my own charter school in the most poverty, uh, economically difficult area of Las Vegas, which is the fifth largest school district in America. You know, I have about 1,200 kids in the school. I have 3,000 on the waiting list. So through that process, and I think tennis combined problem solving, I started to say, wait a second, I have more kids that need that need the education than I'm providing for. So I felt like twice the failure. So I wanted to figure out how to scale it. And I got tired of waiting for government. I felt like philanthropy wasn't scalable it's important and and it's in especially if it's given at the right time in the right place in the right way but i could but we can still innovate as a society so i took a societal daunting issue which is the quality in education and i went to the private sector and i said don't give me your money invest it and what i can do with this is i can take it and i can build schools because i'm not an operator i'm not a i'm not an educator but i'm a facilitator I can build schools for the best in class operators and the money from the state follows the child to the school, which means there's revenue on day one. You don't have to incubate over time. Now, instead of playing landlord through the taxes and bond market, we can write, refinance them out a purchase yeah. ability to buy back this facility to satisfy a like minded investor. Somebody that just wants a very small return, but wants to see huge social impact. So in the last 10 years, through this model, uh, we've built over 120 schools across the country wow. in the most challenged areas. Now, through that process, I've realized that all these schools, they have one central source spot, and that is early childhood literacy and, and, and English second language learning. If we can figure out a way to cross that Rubicon quicker, the trajectory of these children's lives changes dramatically. So I went to Stanford and I met with a neuroscience specialist on how brains work and realized that we actually have the ability to understand how an individual's child's brains work. We just don't have a distribution vehicle that can actually send this out sort of through a technology-based um, you know, platform. So I put together this company called Square Panda and we're now actually, quite frankly, all throughout India getting into schools there as well that work with real-time PhD feedback on each individual's child's brain on how to learn English at a much faster rate. And in America, how to learn second hand, second language English at a faster rate and how to how to be literate at a faster rate. So I, I keep going from one school to all these schools to now millions of kids. So you ask me what my plans are. I don't make plans because I, 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 I just I want to keep going. You know, I got a period of time here on this earth that I want to I want to I want to do the most I can for as many people as possible. 
And, and I feel like this has been a great outlet for me during this time. And this pandemic, quite frankly, has really highlighted, highlighted this issue, the digital divide. How many people in your country, how many people in our country don't even have access to the, to the, to the tablets, to the, to the Wi-Fi, to the, to the ability to learn at home? You know, this, this, is, this is losing a generation and, and, and we can't let that happen. So before I move on to some questions on tennis, and then we've got some questions from the audience. I want to, what age did you start this? This uh, uh, this, com this latest company? Yes. I, I, the latest company I started about five years ago uh, called Square Panda. And it's a okay. it's a platform technology that brings real, real PhD feedback in yes. real time to each kid from the ages of two to eight through a game-based system that is that helps the teacher teach at the highest level because the actual machine learning is is what's connecting the next step in phonics for these children okay so now a, a few questions on tennis so Steffi, women's tennis seems to have undergone a change in pattern which is which i was just making my notes and, you know from long-term yeah. dominance we used to have you know margaret court billy jean king martina and chris Evert, Steffi graf long reigns you know, for, for a decade and more. Uh, now we've got Serena, of course, but we now have new Grand Slam champions in almost, you know, virtually every alternate yeah, tournament. Uh, which is quite unlike what's happening in the men's section. You know, men's section has been dominated by three or four players for, for the longest time, one can think of. Why is that happening? The question is actually for both of you all. Why do you, what do you sense? What is happening? Well, I mean, uh, definitely, I mean, on the women's side, there have been just a, a new crop of just young, you know, very energized young players. I mean, you look at um, um, Ashley Barty, that, that might be a little bit on the, the later um, um, end, but, you know, she came a little later to the sport, play, um, you know, choosing cricket in between, but um, an incredible talent. I mean, you, you see... Um, the last the last tournament, um, a young Polish player uh, coming through, Swia Tech. I mean, they they all um, you, you know have have a have a very um, complete game already, but still have a lot of energy. And it seems it seems that we have quite a few of these young girls ar around um, that that. Uh, yeah, I've energized the women's game in the last three, four years. I mean, you can say a Serena is always a threat there, but you have uh, uh, an Osaka, you have Andrescu, you have all these different players from different from different uh, countries um, that that have come through and, and and shining shining really brightly right now. Yeah, and Andrea, what's what's happening in the men's section? How do you read it? Yes, yeah, so you know, for me, I would say that. I, I wake up every day very grateful that the, the, the highlight of my career, the peak of my career, wasn't during this generation. <laughs> because, because if that was the case, I'd be on here talking about how I almost won this, I almost won that. Uh, but you know, we, but we, yeah, we, we, have, we have three guys that are arguably the greatest of all, all time. You could argue each one and you can make a fair argument for each one. Yeah. Um, and they're all playing at the same time, which is a remarkable error in tennis. However, there's one there's one kind of player that always wins the day, and that's called Father Time. Yeah. So time, time comes, yeah. and they're fighting it as well as I've ever seen anybody, and there's more for them to do. But you start to notice now these younger guys who actually are knocking on the door and believe. You know, from from Zarev to Stisipas to Team to Medvedev. You know, you got these guys who are 20, 21, 22 years old who actually not just believe they can win; they're starting to expect it. You know, and so that to me suggests that there is a coming of a of a change of guard. But you know, I'm out of the business of predicting these top three great ones because it's they're they've really done things that the sport hasn't seen and. And they'll probably continue that for a little bit longer. So before I take the question, my final question is, you know, there's been a proposal by Roger Federer. We've, uh, we've seen that, that, you know, the WTA and the ATP should merge and there should be pay parity for, you know, that's one of the obvious and mo most pushed for uh, outcome from the merger. 
but logistically do you see that happening possible yeah, you know it's interesting it's uh, um, logistically is a great way to phrase it because uh, I'm not sure about what all the challenges would be in the logistics what I can say is you know when men and women show up together it is a it's a win for the audience because it's a it's a um, you know, it's it's a it, it's kind of like you get a little bit of everything. You know, it's it's a win. But at the same time, you know, tennis is a business, right? Yeah. Tennis is a business, and tennis provides content, and the value of that content is based on the consumer. So, you know, the idea of equal pay isn't a human rights issue. It's not. It's not voting. It's this is an industry. There's there's investors and sponsors taking risk with their dollars and have a say in how they want. To invest those dollars and where they want to put the bulk of that allocation versus the return and the idea in any business is to create as much return as possible so i think we kind of get a little lost in the conversation when it comes to uh technically when we talk about equal pay because the in some cases i know people that want to watch women more than men and they should get paid more you know yeah. so as a result i think there's a lot of a lot of moving parts to pull that off Stevi, you have an opinion on that? Well, I completely agree with Andre on that. Um, there's, yeah, there's not much more to add. I mean, I, I have to say, in terms of the logistics, I, I didn't really pay. You know, I haven't really followed it um, as closely to really comment on that. Okay, so let's let me move on to the questions. Actually, I've been flooded with questions, so I'm going to read out a few. Uh, there's one from Kunal for Andre. As someone who had rivalries with people across two eras, and most notably with Pete Sampras, how is Federer versus Nadal versus Djokovic different from any other rivalry in the past? Well, first of all, the first player I've ever played was Harold Solomon, then Jimmy Connors, then it went through <laughs> Lendo, Lendo Edberg Becker, then yeah. it went through Sampras, Curry, or Chang, then it went through Novak, Nadal, and Federer. So, um, not two, four, <laughs> at least <laughs> a, a lot of generations. But uh, what I would tell you is the day I played Federer, um, that was the day I realized that I was playing, you know, the greatest player of all time at that moment, you know. And, and I think since then, I played Nadal a couple of times. Since then, Nadal has answered that bell. Um, Nadal, I never got to see Nadal's best tennis. And I and I'm very thankful for that. I, I don't want to. I'd rather see it. I'd rather see it from my couch than see it from uh, the other side, the worst seat in the house, which is which is the other side of the court. Um, and then Novak, you can make an argument for for Novak too, who has a winning winning record against both of them, who has done some accomplishments that they haven't done. Who, by the way, you know, um, you know, in my opinion, can play on any surface and be the favorite to win, which is a remarkable thing to say during. You know, during during this generation, but but um, but overall, I mean, I think tennis is the winner. You know, it's it's just uh, it's 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 great for me to watch it and 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 appreciate it, and I think we're all going to miss it. Yeah, I mean, you all guys have been role models for you know this, this, these generations that have come after you all. So, Kunal has got another question, and this is for Steffi. Yeah. You retired three weeks before Serena Williams won her first Grand Slam title, almost as if you were passing on the baton. What do you feel about the constant debate about who's the greatest ever? Well, I'm just I'm just happy that I'm in that in that equation. <laughs> you know, I you know that's um, yeah, like you know, as her accomplishments have been incredible, and watching her through you know such a long career, yeah, it it it's amazing. You know, I felt like I was I was pretty ready at at twenty nine thirty to retire, but seeing her mental toughness and kind of seeing how she is still so determined out there and, and pushing and, and, you know, uh, um, eager, um, that, that just is mesmerizing to me. So uh, in terms of the greatest of all, you know, I'm, I'm so content and happy with the career that I had that it's not an important, it's not important, honestly, for me. Um, but uh, to be mentioned at it, it, you know, is 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 you know, and recognized for the career that I've had. I, I I cherish that. But life is so far away from tennis at this point that yeah. I, you know, I don't I don't lose any sleep about something like that. <laughs> if I had to post, post the same question on Twitter, it'll go viral and there'll be a debate for weeks on end. 
So you know whether. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm very oh. happy with, with <laughs> what I've, I've been able to do in my, in my career. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. Apurva has a question. Apurva Sharma, what is your opinion on children taking up sports as a career, especially in India, as parents are still not very really okay with the idea of children taking up, you know, sports. They would rather that they spend time in academics. Andre, you've been a veteran. You've come to India so often, so you should be able to answer that. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, what I can say is, you know, there's there's a lot to be said for a, a quality of life. Uh, and what that means in different parts of the world, you know, and in rural areas throughout India and in 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 the cities. I mean, uh, being able to speak English takes you from in a caste system takes you to to a concierge at a hotel, which changes a life, which changes a, a generation. Education changes so much. You know, what I worry about, generally speaking, about um, kids in sports is not the kids. I worry about the parents. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, the kids should play sports. Uh, you know, as an additive, and if they excel at it, and it's natural for them to be self-motivated, uh, but to decide what their child should do, I think removes the, it, 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 you know, I think that's the biggest crime in it, is, 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 is forcing a child to say what they should care about. I mean, I think there's a responsibility as a parent to make sure they have an education first. And yeah. then, and then I think there's a responsibility as a parent to allow their child to excel and be self-motivated in sports as opposed to living vicariously through their children's sports. So I'm going to have, I've got a couple of questions for Steffi and uh, you know, one is from Shubhajit Roy. He says, Steffi, will you write a book? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think we've, we've, one book in the family is, is, is enough. <laughs> But, uh, you know, yeah, if, if you I can't be to... open and shut, you know, <laughs> you have another book. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I seen, you know, watching Andre go through the process of, you know, really putting three, four years into the book. I mean, the the, the dedication and the, the, the time and, um, you know, it was an emotional uh, time as well. And, and but, um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not quite ready. I am. Uh, yeah, I, I don't quite see it. I, I feel like that book would be really thick. Um, <laughs> you know, it's the, the difficulty of taking out what's important and what, you know, res re what resonates with the reader. I mean, Andre, um, you know, just, uh, I think, did such a good job. I don't, I, you know, I, I, can, I couldn't live up to that. <laughs> there is another question for you, Steffi, which is from Arpita. Yeah. Steffi, you're an icon for women in India. Many of us have learned about sports, leadership, humility at the top after seeing you for so many years. How does one manage all this and constantly keep winning? What is, is there a mantra for it? You know, I, I you know, I, you know, I, I think I said it earlier, you know, it's, it's every day is an opportunity to, you know, to, 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 you know, to strive for something, to to push your perimeters and and uh, and and live in, in in that day as as much as you can. And and uh, you know, if, if I've I've given I've been given so many incredible things. I feel so blessed. And um, you know, yeah, just just live live in the day and 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 you know, appreciate what you have. And. Uh... There's a question from Sanyukta, and I'll, I'll put this to Andre. What is more important, the drive to win or enjoy playing the game? Well, well I never really got to enjoy playing the game. Because <laughs> 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 it was, uh, you know, we were always measured by the scoreboard. So there was always this priority of obviously trying to win, which uh, sometimes interferes with your ability to, to, to enjoy it. But... For my children, um, for our children, I would hope that their connection to it and their experience in it, um, they value more than the highs and lows of, of, of what comes with it. Um, but I can tell you above and beyond winning on a tennis court, changing the trajectory of a child's future is by far the most, uh, the most rewarding. There's a question from... Uh... Samar Varma, and it's a question for you, Andre. 
says having coached dokovic is there anything you realized even if much later that you should have done differently with him as a coach uh yes yeah, yeah, so so it's interesting uh, no not really i mean i think that uh what novak needed uh, was uh was was reason uh to 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 fight and to care um there it wasn't like he lost his game overnight um there was a lot of information that took him a while to process unquestionably um because he has so many skills that he didn't have to think about the game the way that I thought about the game uh but ultimately me challenging him um on to stop working with him was was a, a reason for to give him a reason to prove something and and he took ownership of his own tennis and and he went back to his roots almost like almost like the the classic with rocky he went back to his roots and found his 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 fight and that's that's always been what he's needed out there in a tennis court if you ever notice him on a tennis court he's always looking to get agitated at something and and if he can get agitated he gets more locked in and he gets more focused and and so no i just might have i just might have uh, i just might have poked the bear a little harder a little sooner <laughs> There's a question from Salil, and this is more, you know, from from a parental point of view. What advice would you give parents about talking to kids or how to react react to the pandemic? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is meant for a question about very young kids. I don't know how old your kids are. Are they? Ours, ours, ours are 19 and 17, so 19, 19. so it's uh, you know this it's it's. Uh, I mean we you know at least they were old enough in in terms of you know school learning online that they were ready for it they were equipped for it um when I when I talked to some of the friends that have younger kids and uh, the challenges of of teaching them and uh, you know and 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 advocating actually being on the screen all the time you know were you know uh, we still hope that the kids you know grow up a lot more away from the electronics and suddenly you have to make it um you you know have to bring them to it which which is a challenge in in it in itself but um yeah i don't know if you, uh, the only thing i the only thing i would say is i think children have taught us how to handle it better because you know they they children are children you know they they have a tendency to live more in the present um then anybody you know then 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 adults it seems like as we get older we yeah. learn to complicate things children keep it pretty simple um and and mm-hmm. i just i just i don't think they i don't think they even know they're struggling but you just yeah. try to make sure that you can manage their life around them so that they can grow through it uh you know productively well i'm deluged with questions but i'm just going to now restrict it to two more uh, because this can go on endlessly uh, one there's one from abha do you see sports at schools changing because of the pandemic and this to how for instance you know kids are not getting into the swimming pool contact sports are now still you know they're not kind of uh, encouraged by schools and parents and coaches etc cetera, etc cetera. do you see a paradigm shift happening in the world of sports well i i can say there's been an interruption of great proportions you know both on a highest level and also you know for yeah. children and and sports in schools and and we, listen we cannot afford to lose sports in schools we cannot afford to lose arts in schools you know you never know which flips which which button you need to flip for a child to have that be their reason to work so hard with their academics so so i think once there's a vaccine and you know w- you know once we understand that there's less fear that maybe exists tied around the possibility of of contracting you know uh covid i think we can i think i think the fear comes down and i think the engagement's going to going to pick up but I, i don't believe our school system our school system is broken no question as a whole but it's not so broken that we're going to forget how important it is for a kid to be active and to be outside and to oh, compete oh and totally i mean all these studies i mean you know there's been so many studies that even you know having sports integrated in the school day how much that does for your concentration and and um you can't take that away from the kids so here's my final question that's to both of you all what what is your big, biggest regret if there is and why is that a regret for both of you i mean you had 
long careers. You had a long. I have no regrets. I'm sitting here. I mean, <laughs> next to him, uh, you know, two beautiful children. I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm good. Uh, uh, no regrets here. Go ahead. Uh, my, mine would be, you know, I, I should have. I should have attempted to get her to say yes about 10 years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think you won the argument for tonight, whatever else may happen, or for maybe for the next week. I don't think Stephen <laughs> will be uh, over the next week at least. But uh, thank you both of you all, Andre and Steffi, for being uh, such so candid and so open and, uh, you know, just just being with with the viewers of Hindustan Times and on this leadership summit and sharing your thoughts about a range of issues starting from the pandemic to tennis to mental health in sports and you know obviously the charitable uh, work that you all are doing and which has a huge impact uh, in in wherever you all are doing it. So thank you very much. May I now ask uh, May I ask uh, Sunetra or thank you, thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay safe and and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Ayaz Mehman, for bringing us that uh, wonderful conversation to hear Steffi Graf and Andrea Agassi's philosophy towards not just their game, and they have such a fan base here in India, but also towards life in general. Thanks very much. And that just about brings us to the end of today's uh, session. We have many newsmakers coming up tomorrow. Uh, and the one I'm looking forward to most is, of course, the one with Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman. So don't forget, tune in at six o'clock. We'll be going live then. Goodbye. A vision becomes a milestone when it helps make our lives richer with love and laughter. When it helps make a cleaner, smarter, and a more beautiful planet. So that you can set off on joyous new journeys and adventures. Building stronger bonds and bridging impossible distances, which take you from the ever new to the forever beautiful. Opening up vistas and windows to a vibrant new world. A vision becomes a milestone when it touches millions of lives. Aditya Birla Group. Big in your life. Amongst the fastest developing states in India, a treasure trove of minerals, an oasis of nature's bounty, powering India's growth, adding steel to its streams, a leader in cleanliness, virgin in its beauty, vibrant in its culture, a land of promise, a land of opportunities, a state like none other, Chhattisgarh. I'll tell you. When you buy an Usha sewing machine, more than 1% of the proceeds go towards empowering women in rural India through Usha Salai schools. That's why. You have 10 minutes or I'm gone. I'll take a lot less. Send in the drones. Show maps. It seems like everybody wants you. I'm born magnetic. The all new I-20. Born magnetic. Rishi, what are you talking about? They are saying that I have to save all the dangers of my life. 
फिर तो मेरी लय खतरे में है क्योंकि जो कॉकरोच से डर जाए वो मेरी क्या रक्षा करेगा वह कॉकरोच छोड़कर तुम्हारी पूरी लाइफ एकदम सिक्योर है स्मार्ट लोगों की क्लियर है प्रायोरिटी बाकी सब बाद में फॉर वाले रिलेशनशिप से पहले एल In India, I learned that you don't add masala just to the food. You add it to everything you do. I learned that flavor is more than a taste. It's a sight. It's a sound. It's a science. In India, I found the secret masala spices that make all the difference. The joy with which you cook. The love with which you serve. It's a human thing to want the truth. It doesn't matter if you're older or part of the youth. We certainly don't like being kept in the dark between all those lies and those question marks. But lately, it doesn't seem to bother us when they bend and break and twist and crush the truth. That's supposed to matter so much. In the race to be the first who breaks the news, they seem to have broken the news. And do you even remember the time when the news was supposed to make you wise? And now you can spend hours consuming and listening them shouting and complaining, and in the end, just feeling worse off than you did in the beginning. Which begs the question: Does all of this not trouble our generation? When they push opinions and call them facts, as we watch the fourth pillar crumble and collapse. It is a human thing to want the truth and to make every claim carry its burden of proof to expect that the first voice you hear is also the last word that's there Meet the all new Hindustan Times Now experience engage and express Hindustan Times first voice last word